Thank you, Adila. Uh, so we're going to call this finance committee meeting to order at 6.53 p.m. I apologize for our uh, late start. In compliance with the governor's executive order, suspending certain Open Meetings Act requirements. In order to comply with the state of emergency orders, tonight's finance committee meeting will be held virtually. Uh, so we will call the roll. Yes. Um, Kim? Here. Carta? Here. Halepern? Here. Great. Before we jump in, I'm, I'm just going to move uh, that we amend our agenda to just swap the order for uh, the first two discussion items, the financial projections and the thought exchange review, so that the thought exchange review can go first. Can I have a second for that? Second. Great. Thank you. Kim? Yes. Okay. Kartha? Yes. Halepern? Yes. Okay. Um, so we have three action items tonight. Uh, the first one is the finance committee recommends that the meeting, uh, the minutes of the December 9th, 2020 special finance committee meeting be approved as presented. Second. Great. Kim? Yes. Kartha? Yes. Elpern? Yes. Uh, the second is regarding student fees. Uh, the finance committee recommends that student fees for fiscal year 22 be approved and presented to the full board for approval. Uh, is there any discussion here, Rafael, um, about the fees? Seem pretty straightforward. No, we, we, um, we are open to ask, answering questions you can. Anybody have any questions about the fees? Looked like uh, just keeping it flat. Yes. Yeah, I think just to clarify that fees aren't changing given the right. circumstances. They're not changing. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Thank you. Want me to reread it? The Finance Committee recommends that the student fees for fiscal year 22 be approved and presented to the full board for approval. Second. Uh, Kartha? Yes. Kim? Yes. Hillpern? Yes. And the third action item, uh, transportation fees for fiscal year 22. Um, oh. Raphael, anything there that uh, needs elaboration outside the memo? No, it's pretty uh, standard. Same thing, we're keeping the fees the same for next year. So everyone should know that the fees, student fees and the transportation fees are staying the same as they were this past year. Anybody else on the board have any questions about the transportation fees? Okay. So the Finance Committee recommends that the transportation fees for fiscal year 22 be approved and presented to the full board for approval. Second. Kim? Yes. Kartha? Yes. Halepern? Yes. All right, so for our first discussion item tonight, uh, we have Susan and Jim here from Thought Exchange. Uh, thank you both for being here and for helping us uh, collect the voice of our community through Thought Exchange. Um, and they're going to share a review of the Thought Exchange and some of the analytics and kind of information that we can glean from, from the data. Thanks, Joey. Uh, Jim and Susan, uh, if you want to take it away, just to introduce Jim and Susan too. So they're from the Center for Effective School Operations or CISO. Um, and as Joey mentioned, we really wanted to have um, an independent partner to support us through this process. So um, I know it's a packed agenda for tonight. So without further ado, uh, Jim and Susan, if you want to get started. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, you can all hear me and see the presentation, hopefully. Okay, so my name is Susan Bratt. I am with CISO Communications along with my colleague, Jim Cummings. Um, we'll do a brief kind of uh, intro of what, who CISO is here in just a minute. And um, but just for the purposes of personal sharing, I have been with CISO Communications since April, so not quite a year. Um, but prior to that, I had served over 20 years as a communications director in a four different school districts up here in the Twin Cities in Minneapolis, St. Paul area in Minnesota. Um, 
And uh, Jim, do you want to just do a brief intro of yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Jim Cummings, and I joined CISO in July, so I'm, I'm a little bit behind Susan on that one. But prior to that, I had served over 32 years in three school districts in Arizona as a communications director. So we come to you with the uh, understanding of what it's like to work through a lot of these communications issues that go on in school districts. So we'll start here. Um, see if I can, here we go. So tonight, what we're going to do is we'll uh, briefly kind of give you some background on CISO communications and then also a little bit on thought, thought exchange and how it works. Uh, we'll talk about some of the <clears throat> themes and how they were <clears throat> gathered and collected. We'll talk, give you some findings, um, some of our conclusions and considerations, and we'll have some time for questions and any final thoughts that might come up. So we'll keep going through that. Uh, the first is some background on CISO communications and thought exchange. Uh, so one of the things that we like to talk about as CISO Communications, we are a, a company that is actually, communications is actually a division, one of five divisions of CISO. Um, CISO is a firm based in Minneapolis. They, we specialize in offering services, assistance, and support to schools, school districts, and educational organizations. So our whole focus is on uh, school districts and schools. Um, the other divisions that, that the company has are around the issues of facilities, finance, technology, and transportation. The company actually started over 20 years ago focused on trans transportation um, and different services and consulting that they would do around school district transportation. Uh, about six years ago, they started the division of communications. It really took off about a year ago. Um, with the addition of some of us <laughs> and um, kind of spreading beyond just Minnesota to include a number of different states. I think we're up to eight or nine different states that we're working on, working with uh, different districts or, or educational associations. Um, our, one of the things that I wanted to just kind of highlight is that uh, we, we are about rethinking possible is our, is our tagline. And so we, we enjoy getting into things where there might be a challenge or a problem and figuring out different ways of doing it. Uh, we know that schools have been operating the same way for 40, 50 years. And um, we know that not everyone is being served um, equitably. So we are very interested in, in changing that dynamic. Um, so just a little bit about it. Uh, one of our, our deeply held values is around diversity, equity, inclusion. And I know that that's something that's very important to D65. And so um, we commit to that and improving student outcomes as a result. And then we want to, our biggest thing is that we want to help schools make real and impactful change. We see ourselves as partners in that. So that's just a little bit about us. Getting on to thought exchange, um, it's a crowdsourcing platform to gather stakeholder insights. So uh, it's really about making that, um, taking that virtual environment that we've all been thrust into over the last year and how, how can people engage with one another um, around a, a specific prompt question. So the biggest thing that I like to stress here is that thought exchange is not a survey. Um, it's different in that how we analyze the data, it's different in how you participate. So when, when you do a survey, and, it, and it's another tool, so we don't say that it's better or worse than, um, it is just another tool that can be used to engage your, your stakeholders. And as when you work with a survey, it's one way, you know, you provide your information and then somebody gets it. Here you're providing a thought, you're providing an idea, and other people in your community are responding to it. So it allows for a little bit more of that crowdsourcing kind of idea and the ability for them, for all participants to rate the ideas of other people, um, allow for not just more engagement, but a little bit more prioritization so that it's not just always the loud voices that you're hearing. Um, you know, every, every community has a loud voices, but are they a vocal minority or are they, do they represent others in the community? And that's knowing that a big part of uh, your organization is to reach out and elevate the voices of traditionally underrepresented um, populations. We want to make sure that we can do that. And thought exchange might be a way to just sort of take us a little bit in that direction. It doesn't solve it, but it helps us get there a little bit. Um, in terms of how the process works, it's a three-phased process in the span of a condensed period. So first of all, you would get on, you would identify what language you want to participate in, 
you to answer some survey questions and demographic questions as, as the board has identified, we'll go through some of those. But after you do that, then you share your thought. There's a prompt question and you share your ideas about what, how you might respond to that. Then you would go in and then you get to star and rate the ideas of other thoughts that have been shared. And then at any time you can go and click the discover button and which allows you to see what are the top thoughts there? What are the hot topics? You know, what are the things that people are really seem to be engaging with? So you get, to, and then you also have a chart of your activities. So if you saw that you gave something five stars and you want to go in and change that back to three stars, you're able to do that through my activity. So it is a, a unique way of being able to see all those results kind of in real time. And finally, I just wanna remind um, people that there is the live report of the exchange that I believe Melissa will be sharing with the community. Um, and that live report allows you to you know, go in, look at the top thoughts, allows you to uh, click on different themes that have been developed and say, what were the thoughts that actually got put in that category? And then the other thing to remember is that we have two different ways that we analyze the data. We analyze it based on frequency, which is this little thought bubble bubble with the number sign in it. And then it's also about star in terms of how you starred them, what sort of importance you placed on them. So you can see the difference between those. This is just a static graphic. I can't actually click on it, but if you click the live report here, you can go in and do that. I think next I'm gonna turn it over to Jim for theming. Thanks. Um, whenever you get, whenever we do a thought exchange, we like to, we read through each and every thought that is, that is shared with us. And when we do that, what we find is that there are trends that emerge. They bubble up um, from, from the thoughts that are, that are shared with us. And so in this exchange, though, there were several instances where there were just a high number of shared thoughts. And they were met also with a high level of engagement among the participants. And that really stood out. And specifically, those thoughts came in the administrative spending area, COVID, curriculum and learning, and district spending. But as we noted, that there are two different ways to look at this. You can look at frequency, uh, but you can also look at engagement. And in four other areas, equity, diversity, the recruitment and retaining of staff, school board, and special education, there were not as many thoughts shared, certainly as in the other areas, but the, the rate of engagement, the amount of engagement in those areas was significantly high. And we should note that this exchange had an extremely high level of participation. And so it's, it, which probably comes as absolutely no surprise to any of you. So in terms of the report findings, um, we're just gonna go through some of the, I know that um, uh, in talking with Dr. Horton and Melissa that there's a, an interest in kind of diving a little bit deeper into the survey and demographic questions that we did. So when we look at just in general, we'll look at some, some uh, demographic information that we've gathered and I've kind of pulled up some ones based on conversations that we've had with the board chair as well about what, what sorts of things are important given your other efforts that you're working on. Okay, not sure what happened there. Let's stop share and try to share again. Okay, it just booted me out. So let me just try again here. There we go. Are we back? We are. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay, that was weird. Um, so anyway, the participant language, most people put it in English, which is probably not a surprise. About 2% of your respondents uh, did so in Spanish, because uh, as I mentioned before, Thought Exchange has the ability to, the participant gets to choose the language that they want to participate in. They get to see all the other thoughts in their home language and participate that way, which is a nice way to make sure that we're ensuring everyone has some access. Um, we did have a small number of respondents participate in Korean, French, and Chinese. So those were the languages that were identified as part of the exchange. Uh, let's look at race ethnicity. So um, when we look at that, we see that uh, from what I understand in your community, this is a fairly representative sample of, of your overall demographics in your community. So you see that there's about 57% who, who identify as white, 10% identify as black, 7% identifying as Latinx, 
and then and four percent identifying as multi-ethnic or racial and then you can see the other ones is there as well i think that one of the key things to note is that you had 14 and a half percent of the participants choosing not to answer that question so you know take all that into consideration as well as the multi-ethnic racial which we know that that is a growing uh, category for people to be able to respond to. When we look at where people are living in the community, um, first you can sort of see here all the different wards that you have. Um, I understand Ward 6 is a very active community, so it's not surprising that you see a larger percentage of activity there. However, I think it's important to note that you had almost 16% people saying that they didn't know, even though we included the link to find out what ward you lived in, people didn't go there. And so they just said they don't, I don't know what ward I live in. So that is a, a, a little bit of a skewing of the results when you look at that. And um, I know that based on race and ethnicity and ward, um, I believe board chair had asked for the um, the cross tabs of that. I'm still working on getting the cross tabs cleaned up from that. So I will be sure to send that to you so that you can see if, how representative that is. Uh, we also asked about uh, what's your relationship? So that could be whether you're, uh, obviously we have 71% 70, of the people participating identified as their, their primary role as being a parent in the district. Or a guardian. Um, you have about 22% saying that they were a staff member primarily. You have 6% saying community member and then you had just a, just a handful of students who also participated and students include both D65 as well as the ETHA. I'm not sure what, I can't recall what the ET stands for, but that's your high school district where I know your students funnel into. So there was uh, one participant from that district as well. Uh, we also asked whether you were pro had a program affiliation with any of the following programs. And so we looked at early childhood, elementary. Um, most, of your, most of them are coming from elementary. We did parse out magnet school from that and middle school as well. So you can see the difference. Um, and again, you also have nearly 8% saying that they have affiliation with more than one, meaning they have children in more than one school probably. So. Um, Let's see, staff role, we, uh, there was a, a desire to know about for those people who are identifying as staff, what is their role in the district? You can see not surprisingly that the majority is our licensed educators, which usually falls true for, for districts. But then you have a, a you know, 13 and a half percent saying that they're support staff, 12% are related service providers and 9% are identifying as administration and that could be school-based or district level administration. Then we asked a few other questions. Um, the district wanted to, to learn a little bit more about how, how representative this dis, how representative the population is. So we asked, do, do you currently receive any special education services? 20% said that they did. Um, emerging bilingual services, about 6% said that they did. And then we also asked about gender identity and um, they were asked if they, their child or a child in their care identifies as LGBTQIA+. And there we saw 8% saying that they did. So that kind of gets you through the, the demographic parts of it. Then when, as Jim had mentioned, we had a very strong engagement of those who participated. Um, granted, when you only have, when you have 1300 total, 1,376 total participants, um, certainly that doesn't rep mean your whole community because your community is much larger than that. But keeping in mind that you had of that group, you had 43% shared thoughts. Now that is a, in our experience to have nearly half of the people actually sharing a thought and not just sort of going in and rating other people's without sharing a thought. Um, that's very, that's in the high category. Um, in total, you had 1,400 thoughts shared. 58% of the participants explored the thoughts and 72% rated ideas shared. That is extremely high. And in all, um, when you look at all the ratings, 50, 57,584 ratings were accumulated. So people put in a number, a very strong number of participation of ratings 
the strong participation and, and the ratings that indicate an extremely high level of engagement um, of those who participated. Another way to look at it is with this, this kind of diagram that we pull out and what you can see looks like a mess, but um, the little people icons are the participants and then the little thought bubbles are the thoughts that they shared. And so you can see how concentrated in the middle of that are people in terms of rating and sharing thoughts. And so it's a very strong engagement level. And if I could, I can tell you that usually when we put these, when these maps are put together, it's actually put together in thought exchange. It usually takes maybe in typical exchange, maybe 10, 15 minutes to run. This one, because of the width and breadth of the participation and the engagement took over an hour to go. <laughs> so, um, some other findings that we did in our analysis, we looked at differences and agreements. And what that means is that um, when we look for differences, there would be group A would, would rate a number of ideas really highly. Group B would rate those same ideas low and then vice versa. Group B would have some ideas that they would rate highly and group A would have said, yeah, not so much. So whenever, when I looked through all of those kinds of where those divisions sort of popped up, the interesting thing that came out is that where the common ground is, and that's what we try to look for is our, where is there common ground that we can message? Where is there common ground that we can target um, some communications to and bring people together? And the common ground was the same for all of those divisions. And it really focused on making sure that the district is putting resources and programs and services that are closest to the students and then reducing administrative costs to include paying for outside consultants. So there is that kind of, the second one is I would say a pretty common theme. Jim and I have been in school districts for years, gone through budget adjustments for years. <clears throat> and I have never been through an experience where cut administrative spending has not been the top thing that's come out for people. And um, we'll talk a little bit about that. But the, again, focusing on, on focusing your resources to those that are closest to the students. We also looked at some heat maps that we like to do and they kind of help us understand where people are at in terms of their intensity for and where they're placing importance. Um, we looked at these and you can see if we just look at their, where their identified role, uh, you can see that employees really, really put heart, strong emphasis on administrative spending and recruiting and retaining staff, probably not a big surprise. Um, those general community members talk about, talk very strongly about administrative spending. Um, for parents, there wasn't quite the intensity of those, but they did again, focus on administrative spending. So there's some opportunities in our, in our recommendations there for how to look at that. We did additional analysis. I didn't put them in here, but they're in the report for, if we look at the different demographic questions that we asked, whether it was race, tenure, um, I'm blanking now on the other ones that we did, but uh, you know, just looking at the different things and, and we did sort of, we did put in some information about what was, what was most frequent and, and what was most important. And you can see that. Um, and we'll try to do some, I, I spoke earlier to some of you about how we can try to dig a little bit deeper into that data. The key thing, the tough thing here is that everything is anonymous. So I can't, I can't attach a thought to an individual, um, but I can look by group. So I'm gonna try to dig a little bit deeper based on some requests from some of the board members. Okay, so after Susan does a deep dive into that data, we, we take a good look at it and then we come up with some conclusions and some considerations for you. So let's take a look at the conclusions first. Um, and so we're just, you can see those bullet points themselves, but, the, but what, one of the things that we found is that D65 should really conduct a study of its administrative spending in an effort to find efficiencies and to share the results of that study with its staff and community. Um, my understanding that that is something that's already begun within the district. So you're kind of ahead of the game in that way. Now, this isn't, however, to suggest that the current spending isn't properly targeted or needed. You know, we know from being in school districts for over 20 and 30 years that, again, the administrative spending is kind of low-hanging fruit. Um, it's, it's the easiest thing to, to get at because it's allegedly the furthest thing from the classroom, even though we know better. Now, um, what it does suggest, however, is a lack of understanding for the need for, of, 
for the administrative expense. And it also suggests the need for stronger communication in regard to the scope and responsibilities of these roles and why spending in the area is so, is so necessary. The, um, the intensity of the respondents to the thoughts in this area also strongly suggests not examining administrative spending would be detrimental to morale and transparency of the, prior, of the prioritization process that you're all going through right now and should cuts be required. Um, we should also note that concerns around administrative spending are not in common, as we said, in school districts and are often the highest rated and strongest intensity areas and targeted for reduction. But it's also important um, to demonstrate that the need for administrative positions and what impact they have on student outcomes. One of the other things we found is to examine spending on consultants and curriculum. This is probably the two other things that bubbled up the most. Many respondents believe that D65 staff is absolutely capable of developing highly engaging and, and effective curriculum, as well as professional development to implement it. Uh, we continue with our conclusion. Um, equity and diversity is extremely important, not just to us as an organization, but clearly it is to your district. Um, we, uh, the data suggests that, that D65 take more action on its commitment to equity and anti-racism by demonstrating more support to minority and underrepresented groups, training for staff and residents and equal access to technology. And this is important, that includes broadband. Um, and while, you're doing all this, you'd also need to continue to work um, on closing the achievement gap. Finally, um, reserve, review the perceived represent, over-representation of black and brown students in both special education and behavioral programs. That, that was made very clear. Uh, more conclusions in, under curriculum and learning. Uh, the uh, participants ask that you review the program and review your curriculum spending using as up-to-date data as you have in order to determine both efficiency and effectiveness. Um, in regards to facilities and infrastructure, uh, there are numerous thoughts shared about D65 buildings and what you should consider among them, the modernization of them particularly in the technology area, and not just bringing in new, te new technology, but making sure that it is equitable across the district. Um, there are several thoughts shared um, that you should consider renting out your facilities when they're not in use to bring in some revenue, um, and even some suggestions that as long as you're going, as, you, as long as school is online, that you look for a way to rent out the facilities for other uses. And there are also a significant number of requests for a school in Ward 5. Um, under financial management, several respondents were really concerned and questioned the need for budget reductions given the recently passed referendum. So I think that, that becomes really a communication issue. How that referendum ties in to what you're doing right now, I think is going to be very important to, to clarify uh, among your community, uh, you know, throughout your community. And you know, in, in the, and again, you know, the, the, the district should examine its communications about how the referendum dollars are being used and then draw those connections to the current financial challenges in the district. Um, under representation, um, again, participation in this exchange was extraordinarily healthy. Um, the vast majority of the folks who, who participated identified themselves obviously as families with the second highest level being staff. That's not uncommon. But minimal participation of respondents in other languages other than English uh, doesn't align with your demographics. And so you may want to consider additional targeted communications and engagement with those underrepresented populations. In addition to that, more than half of the respondents identified themselves as white, while the second highest group identified as black. We suggest that it's probably in, to your benefit to reach out to the traditionally underrepresented voices in the district, in particular non-white families, to assure that all of your voices are heard, all of their voices are heard rather, and factored in to the district's decision making. Within subgroups, um, when we looked at the various subgroups, which thoughts rated important or very important, we did see a whole lot of difference when we looked at the frequency of thoughts. But when the ratings of thoughts are taken into account, um, and that utilizes the weighted approach that Susan explained earlier, we found much greater variabil variability. So we encourage the district and its leaders to review these analysis to help develop targeted messages that are gonna address the concerns of specific audiences. So we 
leave it to you for to uh, that's kind of our findings and report. Um, obviously, you have the full report in front of you and, and the link to the live report. But we just wanted to kind of go over some of that, talk a little bit about how we got there. What questions do you have for us? Thank you. Any uh, any board members with questions about the report? I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, it's Susan and Jim, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. Mm -hmm. um, I just, the last comment you made, I think you said that there was some consistency in the thoughts that were shared among marginalized populations, but not consistency in the ratings. And for that reason, we need to do some more targeted outreach. Am I understanding that correctly or no? Yes, you, that's correct. Okay, thank you. John? Okay, sorry, I'm on a headset, so I hope that you all can hear me okay. Um, when we were talking about, thank you, uh, when we were talking about the, the employees who answered the survey, was there an opportunity for the different stakeholders like custodians, um, our health clerks, our secretaries, was there the opportunity for them to fill that out? Because I didn't see them represented on the graph and I wonder if they answered in a different category or if they didn't answer at all. Just, I wanna make sure that like all our stakeholders were involved in that process. I don't think the question broke down staff by, by unit. I think it just asked if you were a staff member. So they, so no, I know no, like- we did, no, we did, no, we did we break did. it down by so, unit. Yeah, okay. and they yeah. could identify um, the categories that were sent to me from the district yeah. is what we put so in there. They could put in, they were either a licensed edu edu uh, educator, a paraprofessional, an administrator, a member of the support staff, or excuse me, related to a service provider, a social worker, psychologist, something like that, or that they were not an employee. Yeah, yeah. so, and when we had it there as a support staff, we put, for example, and then we had, mm -hmm. so for each of those, we kind of, it said, for example, and the different um, employee groups that would be included in that. Mm -hmm. They would probably have labeled as support staff then at that point. Correct. Okay, thank you. Likely. Yep. yep, maintenance I think was included in there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There was, um, Jim and Susan, there was a lot of the report that I felt, um, for lack of a better word, was expected um, mm -hmm. or anticipated in terms of the findings. Like you said, uh, administrative costs isn't a surprise to, to come up. Um, is, there, is there any reason to, to believe that that, you also said it was a healthy exchange. So uh, how do you reconcile the, well, I, I not that I didn't learn anything new, but I didn't learn anything new from the data because it's because I've heard it from community members and in other forums from other people. So, well, I, I think uh, number one, you should have expected these answers. Um, there, if if there's any genuine surprise to you in here, then um, that would be a surprise to us. The the meat of this report, though, even though you know we've talked about administrative spending, I think that the, the real meat in this is under the the district spending category. Uh, the district spending theme, because that's where uh, a number of ideas are shared with suggestions and for how you go about determining budget priorities, um, whether that would be, you know, finding efficiencies in transportation, um, looking at a way to improve your facilities, or, you know, simply just, you know, spending less on curriculum by doing it in-house. That's, that's where the real meat of this is. And if you go in there and examine those answers, it's a real launching point, I think, for your discussions, even, even more so than the, the administrative spending. Although, again, we certainly recommend you take a look at that and examine that for efficiencies. But in the end, the real meat in this is under the, is under the, the uh, district spending and frankly, also the curriculum um, uh, theme as well. And I think the other thing to your point, um, just is that uh, it's kind of what we what we do when we do engagements in general, in that what is the purpose of the engagement? And the purpose of the engagement and you being in, um, 
from what, everything that we've learned about the district, you're a very active and engaged board and you're, mm -hmm. and you're con making concerted efforts to get out into the community and, and hear from your constituents. So the fact that the results don't really surprise you is actually a good thing. It shows that you are out there. Um, but the point that I think is important is that it's about, it's about offering your stakeholders an opportunity to have a voice. So rather than just you saying, yeah, I know what you, I know what you think, um, you know, because we're out in the community, this actually mm -hmm. gives them that real feeling of engagement and finding out what's, finding out what's most important to, to your community. And, um, and then whenever it is that you do make decisions, you're able to point to, to a piece of data to say, this is what we heard was really important. And so therefore you're kind of getting some buy-in on, on those decisions. So I hope, you know, I think it's really important that, that it not be confused with, well, that was kind of just a waste of time because now you have 1300 plus people in your community who are like, oh, you know what? They asked me about that. I remember when they asked mm -hmm. about that and you can see the results of it. And when I've, when I've, when I was in a district using this tool, um, it, it was very helpful to be able to point back to say, this is what the community said was important. Mm -hmm. And this is why, this is one reason why we're doing that. So, you know, you, you have to consider multiple things. You have the financial details, you have, uh, you know, other aspects of the districts and other, other things that are weighing on the budget, but at least you can say that you went out and made a concerted effort to hear from your community. Yeah. And, and, and that's, that's, and if I could just kind of dovetail into that, that's not just important that you be able to say that to your constituents, to your community. Um, it's also important that they realize that they had a chance to participate in that and, and participating or not participating was really their choice. And frankly, not participating is a choice all by itself. And in some ways um, it shows you one of a couple of things. One, maybe that, they didn't quite understand what was going on or they didn't feel qualified on it. But on the other hand, it also shows um, an amount of trust in the district because you people, you, you folks are the professionals. You're the folks who run the district. There's confidence in you that you're going to do the right thing. Yeah. I just want to, I just want to comment on that. And I really, again, appreciate the work uh, and your help in, in getting us engaged, you know, getting our community engaged. I mean, I really, I, I am a, a full on, uh, community engagement advocate and making sure that we get the voices of folks uh, at the table, in particular, most marginalized, right? So I'd love to see some of the weighted, uh, you know, um, responses, right? And how they differ for sure. And and also just really, you know, we, we also went ahead and had our own um, board cafes uh, where we sat with folks and we were asked these very questions, right? And they, they aligned with what we were, what we see, what we're seeing here in the report, you know, you know, how can we have some of this high administrative costs, right? Um, and um, the way I responded is, uh, you know, I, you know, I, I see us in regards to the administrative costs. I really see trying to find a way. You know, we hired a new superintendent, a superintendent of color, and right now, I, and given now that we have COVID, right, we 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 really need whatever help we can get at the very top, as well as for at, at all levels. Uh, it's like all hands on deck uh, to make sure that we get through this. Uh, and really push forward our our our, um, our focus on equity and making sure that we embed equity across the system, right? So that takes an investment because there's been disinvestment, and particularly in our in our communities of color, uh, in, in in their aptitude to do things and in the way we perceive. Uh, so you know there there is this need, right? To so for folks out there who are asking, okay, why 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 are those administrative costs high, right? I think it's you know we we are really trying to invest. In, in ensuring that equity is embedded in what we do. Uh, and that's gonna take, uh, you know, what time and effort from all, all folks across the system in order to really transform the system into a system that's equitable and normalizes success for students, right? And again, we're also planning to make sure that we have, we, we address structural deficit, right? We're gonna do audits across the system to make sure that we're working as efficiently as possible. So we may need this investment at the front, at, at the front end right now, but again, we will continually audit. That's our job uh, to be, you know, you know, uh, fiscal or agents to the community and making sure that we're doing this. So I think we are, again, in, in doing this engagement, I, you know, again, we are, I, I'm committed to doing this over and over again every time we do a budget, because I think whatever way we can communicate to, to, with communities and hear from them, and particularly our most, uh, you know, our communities that we don't usually hear from, I think, again, that's very clear on this report. So we, we need to work with our face department uh, to, to really kind of dig into this and really make sure that we're getting out there and digging in and, and, and getting the folks of folks who 
uh, getting the voice of folks who haven't been part of the conversation be, be part of this conversation and really also educating okay, well how does the budget impact my kids outcome what does that mean to, to my kid because we have these high level conversations around budgets and deficits and all that but what does that mean for my kid right and, and uh, so then really uh, and, and our community's kids and really kind of getting digging and starting from that point in re- when we think about moving ahead with what the report suggests in regard to you know, helping people understand why we're making these investments. Yes. I, I'm wondering, you identify that there's some of the gaps um, in, in the thought exchange might be related to communications. Um, I, I was wondering if you had any strategies you've seen utilized for when the thought exchange emerge has if something emerged that's just not factually based, right? Like, so clearly there's confusion over the referendum dollars and how they're supposed to be used and when they're mm-hmm. supposed to run out and kind of all of that. So then if something emerges that it is then perceived as a mismanagement issue when it's not, when it's based on not having an understanding of how those dollars were supposed to operate in the first place, like what strategies have you seen districts used to combat when with the priorities that get emerged are not necessarily consistent with all the facts that exist in a district? I think that, uh, yeah, that's a good question. I think that um, it, it's not unusual for those sorts of commi- those sorts of questions to come up. And I think, you know, and in no way is this saying that your communications aren't good because in every district we have to explain, explain again, and then tell them that we explained it to them um, about, especially about how budgets work because they're just complicated things and you got all these state requirements and, you know, all these other things that come into play, (laughs) federal requirements. And so, um, yeah, I think the strategies that work are just keep plugging, keep telling them. And so if this comes out and it shows that by, you know, when we look at this is that, um, you know, Melissa and her team might want to look at some additional community internal communications, particularly, but um, communications externally with parents as well about just, you know, how, how is the budget? And I know that you've already got a lot of that out there. You just need to keep going. And it's one of those things where it's like, I wish there was like a certain strategy that you could get at. And I think the certain strategy is that you just need to keep telling them. And, you know, the rule of, rule of seven is that people need to hear it seven times before they actually, you know, register it and will do some sort of action with it. Well, you know, most people aren't thinking about the school budget all the time. They're working about, okay, my kids aren't doing distance learning and I've got to get food on the table and I've got my work over here. And so I think that um, you just got to keep at it. And like I said, and you got to do it in different ways. So, you know, you might say it one way in the board presentation, you might find a way to work it into a internal to into a e-newsletter and then in a more, um, uh, applicable kind of an applied learning sort of way and saying like, here's an administrator who's doing something unique. And this is part of the, you know, so I think, because most of the time they just don't understand what it is that yeah. is happening over there at the big scary district office. So. Agreed. And, and one of the, one of the big things is, is that when, it, like I say, I, the, the, the administrative cost is always low hanging fruit because it's just easy because again, you know, not everyone understands what's going on, but what people do understand is the level of service that their school receives and that their child receives. And that's all a result of administrative spending. If you, if you want to cut administrative spending, I had a, had a friend of mine in a, in a neighboring school district years ago, uh, go through something similar to what you folks are going through right now. And so he would go out and he would ask people, what do you want to cut? Who don't you want to take the bus? Um, who do you not want to feed? Who, which schools do you not want to get new library books or new technology? Um, it's, it's, if you approach it really from a service level, it's a lot more understandable for people, for, for people who generally don't have to deal with a district budget. John? I do just want to confirm, though, that administrative costs were not analyzed, though, in this report, correct? No, no, okay. no. We, you know, we don't have your budget. We just analyze what, what came into us. They were analyzed. Well, at, the, at the beginning of the thought exchange, we did link to your website where you so, have all that budget information. So if people went there and took advantage of the fact that there was a lot of information already out there about it, um, but we know that not everybody does that. Some people are just going to look at the question and answer and say their piece Mm -hmm. so but yeah we didn't get into no we just kind of lumped it under 
this is what is considered administrative spending as opposed to something that's much more school-based or something, student-based. Thank you, uh, Susan and Jim. Uh, are there yeah, any other you. board member questions for Susan and Jim while they're here? Okay, and thank you, Melissa, yeah. for helping uh, coordinate yeah. this effort. Um, so Thought Exchange was a deliberate effort to um, put a community engagement effort out there asking about what people's priorities are and thoughts are related to the school budget and um, where we should prioritize our spending. Uh, our next discussion item is about financial projections. And that comes to one of the, the themes that uh, came up that Biz just asked about, um, which is why are we in this predicament at all? Why do we have to focus on this conversation? Um, and so here's another chance for us to tell that story um, and to update the board on uh, the financial status of the district. And uh, Raphael, I think, and Kathy, with that question in mind, um, feel free to, to go back in time and uh, reiterate the things that we've heard many times before, the promises of the referendum, what it was meant to do, uh, what it wasn't meant to do. Um, and uh, I'll pass it on to you. Thank you, Joey. I'm just going to start out by saying that uh, to go back to what the referendum was meant to do, it was meant to provide us an opportunity to the district, an opportunity to come up with a fundamental uh, of the, the district finance. So it was supposed to give us the, uh, the breathing room, if you will, to be able to make the changes required to what a referendum was designed to do. So I'm gonna transition by saying that uh, what we are providing to the board today it's a yearly thing that we do. We go back uh, at this time every year, we look at the, the finances, we look at the uh, projected revenue, we look at the expenditure, and using the latest information available to us, economic data, CPI, uh, what, the, uh, what the economic uh, picture will look like, and then we come up with, uh, with a projection, a five-year projection into the future, if you will to see where the district will stand. Now, I wanna caution everyone by saying, the projections are nice, but there are so many things that impact on that. As I mentioned earlier, there's the economy and there's certain, too, we know that. But the longer that you go on, and so the farther you are from what you know, the more, difficult it is to, to predict the future. So we do the best we can based on the information that we have from the data that we have available to us. And then, which is the reason why we refine it every year. So what we again getting ready to, uh, to provide you is the five-year projection. I'm gonna have Kathy to start that. Thank you. Thank you, Raphael. Um, as Raphael mentioned, uh, um, uh, we do uh, present financial projections to the district twice a year, um, February and in September. Uh, these projections, because of the most recent CPI uh, that was released for 2020, has much more accurate information for revenue to be received in um, 2023. Uh, let me say that last February, no one anticipated uh, once in the lifetime uh, pandemic, that that pandemic would engulf our country, our community, and will close our schools for all, almost um, a year. Um, it, pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic had tremendous, uh, uh, put a tremendous pressure on our financial um, situation. We lost uh, over $3.4 million, mainly uh, local revenues, investment income, uh, also uh, some property taxes. Most of this revenue uh, we will not be able to recover. We also incurred uh, additional and unplanned uh, $3 million, uh, to that's to date, $3 million in uh, COVID-19 related uh, expenditures. Uh, overall, we are planning 
that we will spend approximately 4.6 uh, million in uh, uh, um, COVID related uh, remote learning expenses. So if you add those two together, that's $8 million swing. That's something that we did not anticipate uh, last February. Even when we uh, updated financial projections um, this September, it, it did not look that bleak, um, but we know what happened. So all of this is being incorporated uh, into um, uh, financial projections. That's what's forced us to revise um, our estimate. And that's what actually is speeding up discussion um, about eliminating the structural deficit, because that's something that we will be uh, talking to you um, again today. Um, but I also uh, wanna highlight some positive um, information. Uh, despite the pandemic, the district was able to adapt a balanced budget for the current year. Uh, we kept its, our promise to the community about building up referendum reserves. Uh, as, of, uh, as of June 30th of uh, uh, last year, uh, we have approximately 30 million um, uh, in our reserves. And as a result, uh, our ISB financial rating and Moody's bond rating have improved. That resulted in some savings uh, for our taxpayers. Over 2 million uh, was saved by refinancing uh, long-term debt. So let's, uh, let's move to the assumptions. Uh, and before we, uh, we can talk about individual assumption, let me, uh, uh, um, you've seen this uh, pie chart before. It's a picture of our operating revenue. Revenues, uh, you can see that we, um, the district heavily relies heavily on property taxes. Almost 80% comes from local sources. And unfortunately, it's one of the reasons why we, we still talking about structural deficit. Uh, that revenue category is under uh, tax caps. Uh, we, the growth in property taxes is limited to 5% or the CPI, uh, whichever is less and uh, CPI has been uh, under 2% um, uh, for a while. Uh, also, the state funding is very limited. District receives only about 10% of its funding from the state, which is, which is very low and nearly not sufficient to cover our needs. Um, the CPI factor, which determines how much we get in additional property taxes. Um, the two most recent CPI factors that we are using, they're included in these financial projections is the CPI from 2019. Uh, that CPI 2.3% will determine the growth next year. It's really interesting, but with us, with, with, with um, um, uh, local governments, with school districts, we feel the effect of a CPI three years later. Um, so just next, next year, we will be feeling the effect from that CPI. The CPI that was just released for 2020, 1.4%. Uh, and interestingly enough, actually, that's actually very lucky for the district, very close what we had in our projections. So the adjustment is very small because we had one and a half percent. That, um, that amount, that growth will be felt in FY23. So we have a little bit of time to prepare for that CPI. Um, also, um, another change, we were taking um, our assumptions for other local uh, revenues much, much lower. So that 2% that we were making on our investments um, a year ago, that is, that is gone. Right now, we are, um, we are earning, except for the long-term, investments that we made pre-pandemic, um, but the interest rates are very, very low. Um, also, um, another thing that we are restoring, but not to the full level, are some of our other local revenues, such as lunch sales or childcare fees. We don't know how many students will return and will participate in our services. Um, this chart, uh, represents um, um, the history of uh, CPI, Consumer Price Index. Again, this is not a new chart. And uh, the average CPI is uh, 1.76. Um, so again, this is 
that growth is not nearly uh, uh, sufficient to offset um, the needs that we have in the district. Um, another change, um, the state is struggling and in even pre-pandemic, uh, it was struggling uh, quite a bit. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated those, uh, those crises. So we are, we are taking uh, uh, state revenues uh, down by 15%. Um, we, we work with our peers. That's something that, is, uh, that everybody is putting in their, um, in their budgets uh, just to be cautious. Uh, because our enrollment is, um, uh, uh, has flattened, uh, we are keeping our state categorical funding flat as well. Um, we do have a little increase in our federal uh, aid and we have included uh, federal, uh, um, federal um, COVID-19 um, aid in, in our projections, but only the one that we know about. Um, we have been getting questions like, is the 3.1 estimate included in our projections? And the quick answer is no. Uh, first of all, because that revenue is not yet approved, it will be restricted. And even if approved, it will be just enough and actually not enough to cover our COVID-19 uh, needs. Um, so it, it will be restricted. It will not be anything what the district received in 2008. It will not be used to pay salaries, only um, COVID-19 mitigation expenditures. Moving to expenditures, um, another familiar chart and um, uh, a takeaway from this chart is to show you that 80% of our expenditures is spent on staff. Uh, increases in salaries for FY22 to FY24 is known for the members of uh, uh, a teachers union and uh, teacher assistant union. Um, salaries for FY25 and 26 are estimated. Um, we just recently received some good news about uh, our health insurance. Uh, premiums for health insurance are increasing less what we had in our projections. We had 5%. They are increasing approximately 3.5%. Um, so um, we, we should realize some savings. Uh, but we are keeping 5% uh, in the subsequent years. And um, we still including pension cost uh, shift in our projections. It's a placeholder. Um, it, it's not included in the current budget. And if that legislation does not pass, it will be taken out. But we strongly believe that it's better to have a placeholder in our budget um, versus add that expenditure um, at, in the last moment uh, um, at the end. Uh, I mean, we can always take it out. It's about 350,000 in FY22, which is next fiscal year. Um, so we, ju we just feel we have to have that in our projections. Um, purchase services, there is an increase and not because our costs are increasing, uh, but because there were several um, items, um, um, our workers' compensation insurance, um, our contract with RMARC for uh, uh, our buildings and grounds director services, these costs were prepaid with that FY20 um, um, surplus, budget surplus two years ago. Um, so all these costs are being put back on the books. Um, supplies are projected to decrease um, by 14%. Uh, there were a lot of one-time uh, expenditures in the current budget. Uh, they're you know, going away. We, for example, um, the new um, finance and HR software um, that is in the current budget. Again, it's a one-time uh, expenditure. We will be paying a maintenance fee, but much lower uh, than uh, the original cost. Uh, also, what's being added to the budget is the capital outlay. Um, that's a, a referendum designated cost to be uh, included in the operating funds. That cost was taken out um, in the current budget because of COVID-19 um, and because of various additional expenditures and loss of revenues. 
Um, our buildings need um, attention. Um, we have a lot of old buildings. Uh, we need to start adding that cost back to our budget. Um, other objects and tuition, that represents the net cost of park school and special education tuition. That cost is increasing by 9%. And then finally, termination benefits, uh, which represent the cost of uh, sick and vacation days paid for um, retired employees. Um, there are a lot of uncertainty um, about pandemic and economic fallout, uh, also um, regarding uh, CPI factors for uh, uh, tax receipts in FY24 and beyond, as well as future labor contracts. Um, so this is this. So this table um, represents financial uh, projections um, on the high level. Um, and uh, uh, a quick takeaway from this, um, uh, especially if you compare those projections to September projections, is that next year is no longer a balanced um, a budget. Uh, we are projecting, um, um, and this is subject to change, of course, but we are projecting a deficit um, around $2 million. And then subsequent larger deficits. However, um, these projections also represent um, operations of the, of the district on autopilot, means expenditures as they are right now, uh, we, 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 without um, um, changes, without um, curbing any of the expenses, without any of the, uh, um, tools that we, that we put in um, and, um, and, these expended, and these deficits will be growing. Kathy, if I can just clarify. Yes. So to clarify what Kathy said, I'm just trying to be blunt about it. The projection that she just showed is an estimate of if there were no reduction or efficiency, no reimagining of what the district is gonna look like, we keep spending at the same pace. And we know we're not going to do that. So that's what that shows. We know change has been proposed. We will have those big deficits. But we know we are going, we are working on making reduction and also reimagine how we operate the district. I think that is very important to point out. Thank you. Thank you, Raphael. So this is the same information just as a picture. Uh, you can see these deficits are growing again. Uh, um, we won't let that happen, obviously, because by law, we have to have a balanced budget and we don't want our um, uh, referendum reserves be eaten by these uh, deficits, but uh, that's how it's looking right now. So when you compare these uh, projections with September projections, which did have a, a balanced budget, um, uh, what has changed, right? Um, we are often being asked about um, reconciliation with previous projections. So mainly the, the changes in revenues. Uh, when the school closed, obviously we did not anticipate that our schools will be closed for almost uh, 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 10 months. Uh, and as a result, we, we, we lost a lot of these um, um, revenues. And at the same time, uh, some of the fixed costs, the majority of the fixed costs um, continued. Um, so additional 2.4 revenues um, has been uh, removed uh, from our projections. Uh, we had some savings with, uh, with expenditures. So that's, that's a plus. Savings from insurance. We also, we are estimating um, more uh, um, uh, certified um, retirements, uh, which will uh, save money for the district, especially in the long run. Um, so as a result, uh, um, the uh, let, next year looks uh, a little bit more bleak. Um, projected referendum reserves. When the referendum was passed, uh, um, administration was charged uh, by the board to keep track of referendum reserves. And even though uh, the district has was able to accumulate over 30 million uh, in referendum um, reserves, and this is this column, 30 million, 100,000. Um, if we ever pass an unbalanced budget, of course, that amount will, um, will get smaller. 
And I know people ask us all the time, why do we need to make budget reduction if we have the reserves? But good business practice tells us that there's so many unpredictable issues that happen with finance, the economy, the pandemic that we're dealing with, and other things that may come up that we don't know about. So it's always good practice to put a certain money away for a rainy day, and which for individual use, it will be like a, a savings. So I, I just wanted to say that it's not good practice to eat into reserve. We want to, we want to uh, put it in there for if something happens that we didn't anticipate so we can continue to operate without having to resort to excessive borrowing where we pay a usury interest rate. One of the positives of the referendum was the fact that the district was able to restore its fund balance. Uh, Pre-referendum, our fund balance was only about 19%, uh, which was way below what bond uh, rating uh, um, agencies are recommending. And, and as a result, uh, uh, our bond rating was actually um, reduced twice, uh, simply because of the, of the size of our fund balance. Uh, currently, our fund balance is at healthy uh, 40%. Uh, but if we um, pass an unbalanced budget in the future, of, co of course, we will eat into our reserves. And uh, according to these projections, we will be below the 25% uh, which is this yellow line um, in FY25. Um, one of the issues, and, and again, this is not only uh, a problem of District 65, but many school districts in Illinois is a structural deficit. And as I mentioned before, uh, uh, the true culprit is, is the funding in Illinois, uh, very small, uh, single digit funding from our state and uh, our major revenue category capped at um, a CPI. So if you stack that against our expenditures, particularly staffing expenditures, it is very uh, hard to, to match those uh, uh, expenditures. And that's what represented in this, in this graph. Um, the green line on the top represents our expenditures. The red line represents our revenues uh, pre-pandemic. That's where our revenues pre-pandemic were. Of course, now they're being revised and some of the revenues, especially um, a lot of the local revenues, such as investment incomes, that's gone. Uh, they never coming back. So they are represented by the, the, the blue line. So we have this gap. Uh, which is um, uh, the difference in the rate of growth. Um, so if we zoom in and if we just look at the uh, revenue um, growth and expenditure growth, that's how structural deficit occurs. And um, the growth in, in expenditures has been pretty consistent for our district. It has been about uh, 4%. Uh, revenues, um, except for these swings, uh, up and downs in the beginning, is has been about one and a half percent. Um, so that's that's our task. Um, our task is to flatten uh, the curve of expenditures and make sure that these two lines uh, get close to each other, uh, so we don't have a structural deficit. Um, COVID pandemic obviously put, um, um, the structural deficit has been a problem before, but COVID-19 brought the discussion, um, um, that issue um, even sooner. We, we have to deal with it right now. And in order to address structural deficit, uh, the district will engage in a series of audits and reviews to redesign its educational model. So we have a uh, instructional model that, that meets everyone's needs, but it's also affordable. And um, this is what was designed. And I believe our board share this plan with our community already. It's designed in three phases. 
uh, phase one, which will be taking place um, this year and will be implemented next year. Uh, basically, um, um, the goal of that phase is to balance the budget, but also make sure that some of the micro shifts are already taking place. Um, and um, we also will be mapping out uh, task uh, for phase two. Phase two will take place in FY22 and will be implemented in FY22 and uh, 23, and will be a series of reviews and audits, curriculum audit, for example, as well as um, we will be designing uh, uh, master plans, student assignment master plan, facility master plan. We will also engage in demographic study. Um, we will be implementing our new finance and HR software, which should uh, result in several efficiencies. Uh, and then finally, um, phase three, uh, will be the phase when these recommendations um, are implemented. And the main goal is not only to reduce our budget, but do something very different uh, that was done um, in the past, is to reduce its footprint, so to speak, and redesign how certain services are delivered. Because obviously, um, Every time we do uh, a regular uh, uh, expenditure trimming or regular budget reduction, all of this is coming back because it is impossible to predict what's going to happen in the future with economy, with the CPI. Um, obviously, we, we, nobody has a crystal ball. Nobody is going to know when the next recession um, is going to hit us. So this time, the district is committed to um, uh, do something a little bit different. Uh, make sure that we change our operations and reduce our operations so we don't have to engage in the budget cutting every three or four years. Um, um, so, so that is the plan. In the meantime, we will um, continue to use zero budget methodology. We will seek efficiencies. Um, we've been, these are the things that we are doing on daily basis. I mean, contracts are being negotiated. Um, um, staffing costs is being reviewed. Um, every uh, possibility is, um, attrition possibilities are explored. Uh, we've been doing incent uh, retirement incentives. So all of this will take place while we work on these um, three phases of the budget uh, reshaping process. And these are next steps. Uh, we talked about uh, thought exchange review. Um, we will be doing a community service. Um, at the next meeting, uh, the administration will propose, will present a list of um, FY22 budget reductions um, this list, as you saw in the prior slides, will be probably around um, $2 million, um, uh, worth of $2 million. Uh, the, the list will be approved and the work will start on um, uh, phase one and two and three uh, uh, subsequently. And that's what we had. That's all we had for tonight. Thank you, Thank Kathy you. and Raphael. Uh, that was a lot to digest, and uh, certainly the shifts that are in there are um, significant, and it uh, it makes even more need for us to uh, review the thought exchange information. And as a board, we have to we have to discuss um, a number of things as it relates to uh, a the timeline, those phases, um, and how we're going to. Kind of write the financial ship, and I think uh, Kathy, I'll just push back on one thing you said. You, you mentioned that there would be significant change in year three, in phase three or year three of, of that plan. Um, it's hard for me to see how there isn't bigger changes before that too. Um, and I think, as it relates to some of our discussion tonight, some of it is a continuation of our last meeting, which is expectation setting, making sure that we're all on the same page on what we want to do. 
um, what we need to do and make sure that the administration is prepared with recommendations to come to the board in due time. Um, so we do have an agenda. I don't wanna, I don't wanna bypass that. Um, are there any specific questions about the financial projections um, that we saw today or the presentation from any board members for, for Kathy and Raphael? I see your hand, John. I'm just waiting to see if any board members have any questions. My wait time is exceptional. All right, John. Thank you. Um, looking at the, I know that we had the improved ratings uh, that we said like for Moody's, for example, and that that decreased um, our long-term debt. Uh, we were saving 2 million there. Do we know what the annual savings would be from that? So what the savings is actually is a one-time savings that we, that we got. And we use the proceed of that, if you remember to do some of the capital projects that was done this past summer of 2020. You provide an addition to the, uh, to the million 25,000 that was promised to its capital expenditure from the referendum. The proceed from the savings was then used to do some additional roofing work at uh, Washington. Roofing work was done at King Art and some masonry work was done at uh, Nichols. And I know that we, and again, I know all those were, were sorely needed. I know that we needed those things. With the lower interest rates uh, for investments and the decrease in state revenue, do we know how much that's costing us? So estimated, uh, we anticipate that for this fiscal year, we will get as close to the, the expected revenue from the state. Now, we have some long-term, as Kathy mentioned, there's some long-term investment that were locked in, right? And those were, those were based on what the interest rate were before this current reduction in the federal fund rate. So we wouldn't be impacted by those long-term investment. But as those, as the new, as the old investment mature and we have to reinvest them out of our reserves, I mean, the going rate now, if you look at it, it's about, if, you, if you're lucky, you get six basis points. Interest rate is just so low because the federal fund rate is so low that uh, there's a significant loss of revenue from those investments. So that'll be a cost that we'll feel moving forward is what I'm hearing you say. Yes, it's okay. more, yeah, for the, yeah, mm -hmm. for the, as investments mature and we have to reinvest those investments, we have to reinvest them at a lower rate than the ones that we are replacing. And my last question, and I really appreciate everyone's time. So I love the, uh, the wisdom of having a placeholder for potential pension cost, cost shifts to the district from away from the state. As that moves forward, do you adjust, because I saw like every year you add a half percentage point, do you adjust that as you go? So for 2022, it's 0.5 you have projected. If that doesn't happen, then in 2023, do you reduce it from one to 0.5? No, so yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. So without any further questions, um, our next steps this evening are, uh, again, I'll, I'll keep repeating because I want to be deliberate about this. We reviewed the thought exchange data, um, which was an explicit opportunity for all members of community to participate in giving us, the board, some input on decisions that will be forthcoming. Uh, we did have two rounds of board cafes um, over the past month. Um, Madam President and I got to host one of them and Sergio and Rebecca hosted another. Um, so I wanna take a, a moment to review kind of how the board cafes work. It's a different forum. It's a different way for people to engage. Um, Anya and I had, I think we had about 30 people in attendance at ours. We uh, went through some slides and then had an opportunity to answer some questions, but um, definitely want everyone on the board to get a sense for what those board cafes um, were like. Ani, you want to share a little bit about, about our cafe? Sure. Um, we shared some similar information to what was shared today about the structural deficit and its origins. Um, 
the, the referendum commitments and how we have fulfilled those commitments and how that brings us to the planned circumstances that we are in now that we are working to resolve. Um, and I think we had uh, about six questions that we went through um, and they were not terribly unfamiliar or unexpected similar to some of the inquiries that we and um, priorities that were shared with the thought exchange. Um, we had the opportunity to talk about our commitment to keeping um, reductions as far away from the classroom and the experience of children um, and families as, as possible. Um, I think we had some questions about fine arts and orchestra and band specifically. Um, and there were questions about administrative, uh, the, the size of our administrative costs um, and also about CARES uh, dollars that had come to the district. Um, Joey, did, did I miss anything? No, I think you, you hit the nail on the head. And for those looking for the details and some of the CARES money and where it's been spent, you can look at the information part of our packet uh, tonight where some of it's been outlined in a memo. Um, Sergio, Rebecca, how was your cafe? Um, I think overall it went pretty well. We didn't have quite as many people as you did, um, maybe like five or six people from the community. Um, it probably was an interesting experience for anybody who was English speaking and had to listen to the presentation all in Spanish. But um, there, there were several English speaking uh, participants. Um, and I did, you know, just out of, you know, there were some similar questions to what were asked during your session. Um, one thing that I do want to note is that on page 16, there was, um, just a, a reference to a position that was that could be cut, um, which was a librarian position, and just want to make um, make clear that uh, I mean, if you go back and reference those slides, that was just an example. Um, we haven't, we, you know, we haven't voted on anything, so just want to reiterate that to the community. It was uh, it was placed there just as as a sample. Um, other than that, I think um, just based on the conversation that we're having, um, it's, it's more of a statement just to reiterate um, how, how many more times, we have to repeat this probably another four times for the community really to, to understand it. And I wanna thank the community members who did, who have been part of this um, very important conversation and just wanna encourage um, our residents, both who have students in the district and who don't because this impacts our whole community um, at large. And I think some of the things that were covered are a little bit complex. You don't really start paying attention to some of these details until you have a child in, in the district, but um, they're really important conversations. And just, you know, the, the one of the pieces that was shared earlier um, tonight is in having to repeat things seven times for things to stick. And I, you know, just the patient that's gonna be required from us and also creativity and innovation and how we share this um, some of the, you know, the information I've shared is pretty, um, you know, pretty intricate. And if you, you know, if you don't, if you haven't been part of these conversations before, um, there's going to be some, you know, simplifying uh, that we will need to do for the community. Um, and then just again, uh, thank you for uh, repeating uh, the issues with the referendum. I think there's some misunderstandings or just, you know, people who join the conversation later. Um, regarding what we've done with the referendum funds, and it not being extra money that we had to um, to do additional things with. So thank you for that. Thank you, Rebecca. Anything to add, Sergio? No, Rebecca covered it. And again, again, we heard very similar questions. You know that align with some of the thought exchange um, uh, ideas and thoughts that bubbled up along with what you and, and Anya shared. Right. So again, you know, I. Um, I look forward to having more board cafes uh, for other activities. I think, again, anything we can do to 
continue to reach out to the community to provide clarity uh, um, and particularly to sort of sort of those families who, again, may need a little bit uh, more of uh, walking through in regards to understanding that how the budget impacts their child's education as well as their outcomes, I think is something that is worthy of doing as, as the thought exchange um, has, has shown, right? And really trying to make sure that we utilize our face, the family and community engagement department to ensure that we're getting out there and, and, and putting uh, you know some of this information out there and making it as accessible as possible. I, I appreciate you know Kathy and Raphael and, and the work they've done with the budget and the budget at a glance document. I think that's a good place to start uh, and uh, you know to really look at a kind of just understanding how the budget kind of works. So you know I think that's it's, it's, it's a great document to, to to make sure that we get in the hands of folks. Uh, as we start these conversations, even prior, right, a couple of months, you know, I think we're doing, trying to do a good job in our due diligence as, as folks to, to really try to reach out to the community and listen in uh, as they weigh, as we weigh how, how we move forward with the budget uh, and finances for this district. Thank you, Sergio. Um, so as we look to what comes next, um, next on our agenda is a discussion item for more community outreach. And at our last finance meeting, um, one of the things we talked about at this point in the process would be a placeholder for two uh, parts of community outreach. One would be another community survey of some kind. Um, and another one being um, in good partnership with our, with our staff who are inherently impacted by budget conversations, either as, um, as employees or as people who have to bear the the heavy lift of um, changes in um, staffing and programs and materials and, and whatnot, um, staff forums and discussing what that's gonna look like. So um, I definitely would like to open it up uh, to Dr. Horton and your team if you have ideas for what those two things um, are going to look like, a kind of a timeline for those and uh, specifically to make sure that we are getting information from these forums in advance of being asked to make decisions as a board so that we can can take information from these forums into the decision-making process. Yes, yeah, so uh, with the, as far as the forums, as far as the survey, the goal is to release the survey uh, either by Wednesday uh, of this week or as early as tomorrow, if everything is uh, finalized and ready to go. We wanted to have this conversation and this presentation today first before we released it. The other thing with the, with the staff forms, we have a targeted for, uh, in about two weeks, we're gonna be meeting with DEC exec tomorrow and we'll talk more about this. Uh, I mean, this week, we'll be meeting with them to talk about that actual, uh, what's a better timeline to do it. Uh, and we'll have a couple of them, uh, you know, which we're fresh off. I know our staff is kind of worn out. We just had about four uh, staff forms over the, just last week uh, where it was pretty heavy and we're trying to give them a little, a little window between. So we wanna do it before the 8th of March, but you know, uh, give them some time to just kind of get ready for their return uh, for students to class. So the, that's the timeline regarding our communication and participation with staff and also the, com the community survey that'll be going out. Can we get a preview as to what's gonna be asked on that survey? Sure, we can. Raphael, can you, would you like it sent or you wanna just ask some of the questions now? Joy? Uh, is? I just had a question related to the survey of, um, mm -hmm. is there any kind of like myths and facts section before people take the survey or, or some kind of kind of level setting we can do so that, you know, I don't want to keep surveying people and then with, if they have inaccuracies in their understanding, then, then we're not getting back useful feedback. Is there a way for us to, to provide some facts to start and then ask questions about those facts rather than leave it flexible enough that if people have misconceptions then those misconceptions just keep getting perpetuated. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't seen it, so I don't know yeah. what the setup is, but I'm, that's a big concern for me is I don't want to keep asking people for their feedback when they're not starting from the same premise. Right. I, and, then, and I think that task is a daunting task to, to, to try to educate, um, you know, our community and everyone around what the, what's the true uh, challenges we have, but we can provide uh, some of the information uh, that we disclosed tonight um, in our presentation. And I think that would probably give us, um, and I don't know, maybe I can work with uh, Melissa and we can potentially do a conversation with the superintendent and put out, release a video shortly to have that information available before we release the survey. Those are, I think, our best two options to, to, to potentially do that. 
And Joey, I was asking also for you all. We we have we have questions now. We can share with some. Or would you like to have that shared at a later date? Um, I, I'd like to open it up to my board colleagues because I think it's important for the survey to give us information that will be fruitful. So I think uh, everyone should weigh in where appropriate. I agree that I have concerns about making sure that we have the accurate information. I was actually going to suggest a video. Um, I think that our board cafe was, I think maybe both of them were recorded. Um, and so portions of the board cafe clips from that could be taken as, uh, you know, board members sharing this content with the community. Um, and we already have those recordings. Uh, I think, or a conversation with um, superintendent, something that would allow for that accurate information to be included. And maybe, um, I know we have a website or a webpage with this information. I'm wondering if we do want to make a myth and facts sheet that would be a an image that you know, that wouldn't require necessarily wa watching the video, but that would be a quick snapshot of the common misconceptions that we hear and what the correct and more accurate understanding would be. Um, I think that's fair, you know, one, to make sure that we're getting useful, having a useful dialogue with our community with, with these um, tools, but also to ease some of the unnecessary anxiety that folks may be experiencing. Um, this is certainly a challenging and anxiety ridden conversation, talking about um, changing how resources are distributed and allocated. That's going to, you know, we're in, a, in the midst of a lot of change <laughs> in our world right now, and, and it's a lot. Um, and so having that standard anxiety about change and having, you know, unnecessary um, misunderstandings layered on top of that, that maybe folks are intentionally propagating. We need to, I think, do our part to try to dismantle um, some of that experience. So I would agree about maybe adding a video clip or and a myth, myths and facts sheet, if we can do that. And I think, um, I agree, I think a strong educational effort needs to happen before we survey anybody um, so that people understand the pieces. And, you know, I think part of that can be, you know, why now, right? Why, like, why are you doing this in a pandemic? Why are you, why are you bringing up redistricting? Why, like, how are these things all related so that people can understand why they are all part of the financial conversation and why we, you know, why our timeline was escalated because of the pandemic. Just really giving, I think, some kind of bullet facts to start with. And, and I love the idea of some video clips to um, ask people to watch, you know, to encourage them to watch before filling out the survey would be smart. Gotcha. We'll get to, we'll get to work on it. Um, yeah, I just, I just want to add, I know that the video is great. Um, maybe an, an infographic to go before you actually take the survey so you know what you're reviewing. Um, we've done some work um, with the city of Evanston around just getting information to people who, uh, you know, different literacy levels, um, you know, just taking information in a different way. I know that Literacy Works um, has worked with several uh, nonprofit organizations to ensure that the information they're providing is, um, you know, uh, synthesized in a way that, you know, um, takes into account different, you know, different uh, learning, learning types and maybe like language access. So um, if we do that, I think that would be really a good idea to put up front um, be before this survey. And I think too, just, you know, being mindful of, um, you know, while we did get a really, a, a, you know, a decent um, response rate, we're still missing a lot of people, right? So um, there, you know, things that can easily get lost into email um, that we, you know, that we might not get um, the best return on, on the survey. I think I just would be mindful people are pretty tired of filling out surveys and then not really knowing what's going to happen with it. Um, so just wanted to add that. That's a really fair concern, Rebecca. And I think back to 
Um, the team from Thought Exchange Exchange's point is we're diversifying the outreach so that we make sure that we as a board have done our due diligence to give people an opportunity to engage. And uh, we obviously can't force people to. And some people are going to engage in all the forums uh, responsibly and some are, are going to bring wh whatever their facts are um, or myths are to, to that engagement. And we have to expect that as well. Um, and that's just going to be a part of the process. But I think um, it's our responsibility to try to put as many opportunities out there as possible um, going forward. Anything else about the, the community survey? I will just assume that we're going to use the, the normal channels of outreach to try to blast this to everybody within D65 as possible to, to offer it through school newsletters as well as the different older older persons in the city. Yeah, so I could share just very briefly what we did for the thought exchange. So we created a communications toolkit in both English and Spanish that had some sample messages that we used. Um, I directly reached out to of our parent group, so ABC, BPAC, um, as well as OPAL, and trying to reach um, people that may have not otherwise participated. Um, in addition, we did partner with the city of Evanston on the Thought Exchange to put something in their newsletter that went out in English and Spanish to all residents in the city of Evanston, um, and also did a couple text messages as well. So I think that we're trying to be really mindful of reaching people in non-traditional ways, um, so not just relying on people to visit our website or to open an email because we know how inundated people are with the start of school right now and a lot of new information. I do think we definitely have to be very creative. And we can also add to that list. We've been meeting, had some really like great meetings with our with the faith-based community uh, and work to get that information to them as well that they can share. Great. I, I think all of that is um, wonderful. I, I also think that people are moved to engage with these types of um, opportunities through relationships. And so as much as we can, um, you know, encourage individuals to leverage their relationships with other people to um, put this priority in the context of what is um, culturally relevant, influential, meaningful within the actual relationships at hand um, is going to be really key. And I think specifically what I heard from the thought exchange feedback was that we have our marginalized populations um, participated, but the some of the, the data was not as specific as might be useful um, in us uh, applying the racial equity impact assessment tool lens to that data. And so I think um, for this particular survey so that it doesn't feel like surveying just to survey, um, we need to apply some strategy to it um, to lift up and access those voices and perspectives that we didn't get enough specific information from with the thought, thought exchange. Okay. One other uh, stakeholder engagement opportunity is with our, our faculty, our staff members. Um, it's, uh, it's just a good partnership role, but it's also something that uh, contractually uh, we need to do before we are asked to make a decision. And so I think one of my questions for my board colleagues is, um, is about who, who hosts that? Is that something that uh, Dr. Horton and his team host, or is that something that we want um, a board member to, to host or for it to be a joint venture? Dr. Horton's got an opinion on it. Yes, I think we should host that, uh, Joey, in all honesty, as administration, since we are making a recommendation and we have those relationships that are very, that we have to work with them every day, right? And it's um, important that we can have these uh, really engaging and um, authentic conversations. So that's just my, my, my opinion. I, I accept that. Anybody else have a thought? I agree. I think you, Joey, and, and, and Dr. Horton would be your best. Again, you're a finance chair, so you, you, you asked some incredible questions and you have some great insight. So uh, you and 
Dr. Horton would make a great team to host that. All right, so we'll we'll figure out what that's going to be in the timeline, but um, I think it's it goes without saying to the cabinet, um, but also to all all the teachers, uh, John, in your in your bargaining unit and all the others that we're not asking people to come to a fun meeting. We're asking the people to come and get serious and get engaged and to, to share their ideas and insights because we want to hear. Um, and that, that is the goal is to, for us to be listening partners so that we can hear prior to being asked to, to make decisions. Um, John? So I think too, sometimes when I see some of the survey data and obviously, I mean, I feel my bargaining unit is important but there are other equally important bargaining units that I feel sometimes um, that that aren't represented as much in those discussions. And I would just ask that we try to find a way to include as many of the different groups as possible mm -hmm. in that conversation. And, and I know you all are very good with that. I, I just wanna make sure that we're putting forth the same effort to reach out to the different groups as we do to meet, reach out to some of our different communities. Absolutely, absolutely. I had a couple of thoughts. Um, one, I feel like, um, I guess a slight departure from Joey and Studio, your, th your thoughts. I feel like Dr. Horton and his team should host those conversations and um, bring that information to the board. Um, and it should inform um, both the proposal that is brought to us, but also be brought to us in a way that helps to us to inform how we um, process that proposal. Um, I feel like that's the best way for us to ma manage our purview and be respectful of the administration's purview. Um, so yeah, that, that's one thought. And the other thought that I had is um, given the important, what we talked about, the necessity of hearing um, information seven times before internalizing it. There were a couple of things that I just wanted to take the opportunity for us to clarify at the, the board level about our structural deficit. Um, since this is our opportunity, one opportunity that we have to provide that kind of clarity and information for our community. Um, in the slides that we just saw, one of the things that I think Kathy tackled is that um, but I wanted to dig into a little bit more is that the structural deficit has existed for decades, but it was mitigated by the sale of bonds and uh, state contributions. And state contributions have declined over time. Um, and we also ran out of debt service. And so that has uh, exacerbated the, the financial state of the, the district. And we ran out of debt service back in 2016. Um, so that's right prior to um, the, the referendum. And prior to the operational referendum in 2017, there was an, a capital referendum in 2012. And in that capital referendum was the proposition to build a fifth ward school, as well as um, make investments in middle school renovations. Um, and previous iterations of the District 65 School Board made the choice that once that referendum wasn't passed to not build a fifth ward school but still to move forward with the renovations of middle schools. And the way that the, the renovations of middle schools was um, paid for was I believe with the sale of bonds, which is what led to the debt service running out. Um, Raphael, please correct me if I'm not capturing any of that accurately, but I believe that that's the historical nature of the financial state. So in 2017, we had a referendum, operational referendum. That operational referendum was meant to sustain operations along with some particular proposed investments, which were um, 
safe and secure entries in buildings that had not yet received them, um, as well as uh, reading interventions and a commitment to capacity building for our equity work. Um, and then we also had agreed that we would put money back into our, um, our, what is the fund? I'm losing the name. Financial reserves. Financial reserves, but it has a particular name. Balance. Fund reserve. Um, fund balance. Okay. That, that, that's fund balance. That's what I was thinking of. Yeah. So, and that we would put money into our financial reserves or our fund balance in order to prepare, prepare for the eventuality, which we have come to, where our expenditures would exceed our revenues. Um, so the referendum did what we promised it would do. And we've, we've had a resolution in 2017 that we have adhered to, to use the referendum dollars as were promised and planned for. And it is our current responsibility as this iteration of the board to resolve the structural deficit so that we can remain fiscally solvent. And if we did not, then we would not be adhering to our um, legal responsibility to have a balanced budget, but also our moral obligation to our community to steward our dollars in a way that is um, responsible. So I just wanted to restate <laughs> that information, um, I guess, directly from the board to our community in this setting as one of the seven times that we need to get accurate information out there so that we can um, hold on to that as we move forward in this conversation. Thank you, Madam President. I think it also is one of the reasons why our entire board comes to finance committee meetings. Um, it is just that important and <laughs> we're all we're all on the on the team. Um, so our next uh, discussion item is about expectations for the March finance meeting and we can blend that with the discussion for expectations for the March Board of Education meeting. Um, so the March finance meeting is on March 8th. The Board of Education meeting is on March 22nd. And so that's that's four weeks and then six weeks away from now. And the idea here is that the community forum will take place and the staff engagement opportunity will take place um, prior to March 8th. And those, uh, those phases, those three phases that were presented on that one slide that the administration is going to bring a recommendation for us to consider and learn about at the finance meeting. Um, not vote on, but to discuss, ask questions about, and get acquainted with. Um, that is the, and then the March 22nd Board of Education meeting would be when we uh, take action on that, on those financial decisions. Um, let me ask the, the basic question. Am I on the, is that, is that the expectations that all my board colleagues and administrative colleagues have? So we're, we're, we're okay. We're okay with that timeline. And with that's, that's the end goal. Um, I think there's a couple other things that, that we as a board have to do to help tighten the belts. Um, as it relates to the March finance meeting, I, I'll consider this homework for us as a, as a board. Um, but we have um, regularly on our finance agendas, we have bill lists, we have, um, we have P card uh, receipts, we have uh, purchasing information. There's a lot of information that we get as board members. Um, it's publicly accessible and available for those that can't sleep at night. Uh, you're welcome to, to click on the attachments in the information section of the board agenda. Um, but um, I think we all need to team up and make sure that we're all looking at that so we can ask more questions. Um, I, I, for one, would like to discuss at the March finance meeting, um, potentially some policy changes related to, to finance. Um, 
we have in our in our board policy. Um, and Dr. Horton, this is this is for you because it absolutely directly impacts your team. Um, we have in our board policy that uh, contracts over or purchases over twenty five thousand dollars are brought to the board for a vote. Um, I would like for us to discuss and consider lowering that number uh, specifically so that purchases cannot be done without board approval at a lower threshold. Uh, that, that's an idea that I have that specifically will slow down the rate at which purchases can be made by staff within the district. Um, it will require a little bit more thought and due diligence um, and cross-checking because it will have to be brought to, to the board for a vote. Um, and it will allow us as board members to see more purchases in more detail prior to being made. Um, but I, th I think we need to bring some ideas like that from a governing perspective um, to the table so that we can help the organization tighten the belt. Um, and I think we need to be prepared to have some of those conversations at the March meeting. Um, you know, there are, uh, we, we've talked about uh, how do we lessen the bandwidth um, that's used by some of our operations. Um, you know, I, I see in our bill list, uh, Raphael, your, your team, your department um, has to write a lot of reimbursement checks to people who go and buy things and then turn in reimbursement checks. And I understand that's a, that's a ritual that happens in schools because people buy things for kids and programs. Um, and I think, I think there might be a way for us to procedurally change the way some of that happens to that lessens the bandwidth streamline some of the spending um, and, and does a couple of things all at the same time. But I, I'd like my board colleagues to, to think about some things that you see when you look at those, those bill lists and the, uh, those other documents with a different perspective and bring some questions and ideas that we can, from a governing perspective, uh, look at from board policy. Um, and, and again, if you, if you have an idea, um, when I was looking at the bill list and thinking about the procurement cards, I went and looked in in our board policy, which is online, and you type in procurement card and you can read our board policy. Anybody can do that. And you can see exactly what our policy is. When you look at our, um, our contracts, you can look and see that our board policy 4.60 uh, says anything over $25,000 has to be um, brought before the board. Um, and we wanna make sure that we can, we can specify that so that it's actually only certain contracts of $25,000. There's certain contracts of that amount that don't need to be brought before the board, but we can change our policy as the board to say anything over $5,000 of any kind at one time has to be brought before the board for, for discussion or, or a up or down vote. Um, and I think for me, that's just one way that we can slow the rate of spending and uh, bring a little bit more oversight to the financial interests of the district long term. And that's just the, that's just the expenditure side. We then have to also tend to um, some other aspects that we as a board have to deal with, uh, whether it's in negotiating and, and big contracts and things like that. But I think that would be a conversation to have at the March finance meeting um, that we all need time to prepare for. Are there any questions about that? And no questions for me, but one, one of the things I think of right off the bat is making sure, again, that we even though it's a small part of our um, revenue, right, getting, getting to, uh, money from the state and federal government right, in regards to some of the services that we offer, are we, are we maximizing, right? Are we making sure that uh, we're utilizing um, and that maximizing the, the, the money that we are getting from uh, you know, our state and federal government around title, around uh, early childhood uh, block grant? I mean, for me, those are, again, have, you know, working on that side, uh, again, one of the things that we see is that, again, at, at times um, we, we don't really maximize, school districts in general don't really maximize uh, the utilization of state and, and federal funding, right? So what can we do to make sure that that's happening, right? And I know we have, you know, consultants at the, at the state level who come and do, you know, do, it'll do audits every once in a while, but, you know, just making sure that, again, our, our bilingual funds, for instance, uh, for bilingual programs or early childhood block grant, title grants are being utilized uh, at, at, the, at the best possible way. Thank you, Sergio. Anybody else have a thought or idea or a question about the finance meeting for March? Specifically asking board members right now, but Dr. Horton, um, I know some of those ideas probably throw a wrench in the administrative ring and 
Um, again, specifically describing it as trying to slow down uh, some of the spending. Um, there's a lot of things where it's not about what people are buying, but if we, if we make a better plan for it, we might be able to, sometimes it's about a better price. Sometimes it's about, um, you know, making sure that we just have the right approvals in place and procedures. And, um, and in some cases realizing that, oh my gosh, we're buying something and we have it over there. So let's not buy it right now. Um, these aren't big dollar savings, but it's, it's something from a governing perspective we can, we can certainly help do. Um, to add a little bit of oversight from from our purview. Yeah, I would say there's a lot of big things happening, right? Um, team and, and Joey, um, you know, we're opening up schools next week, right? So that's a it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of effort from our team to be available and make sure that those things happen. I'm definitely a fan of um, of tightening up the belt. Um, I think that's that helps us uh, in the long run. Uh, but I think there are some other things around systems that I would like to discuss uh, that would help to give um, to give to give me and my team an opportunity to share uh, some of the things that we're doing and decisions that we're making with the board in a more structured manner. Um, and, and so uh, that what you mentioned, Joy, around um, reducing the the twenty five thousand to lower amount, yeah, I, I think that's that that's, that helps. But there are other pieces that'll still need to be addressed that I think what they could easily. Um, still create some some inefficiency problems for us, but um, I definitely understand. I don't know if March, with this big reduction piece coming up, I don't know if March is the best month. Maybe it's April, right? I don't know, but uh, definitely before the new school year, so we can plan to have the new structure ready to go. Yeah. Well, I want to give the board a chance to have the conversation, whether it's implemented right away or implemented, you know, starting in the summer, can certainly be a point of conversation, but. Um, I want to make sure that we're pairing uh, the decision making around what the financial trajectory and decision making pathway will be with also, um, you know, there, there's only there's limited behaviors of, uh, of confidence that we can give the community that we're doing um, our oversight uh, properly and want to make sure that we we're doing that in sync with uh, some of the decisions we're being made to ask. Mm -hmm. John. You're muted, John. Thank you. I've been on Zoom for a year and I still do that. Um, piggybacking what uh, Dr. Horton was saying, you know, I'm wondering if we're reaching out to our building admin as well about ways to streamline processes, about ways that we might be able to effectively reduce budget, because I know that, you know, they're an important stakeholder too. And I know, you know, when we talk about this, you know, we, a lot of times, I think I, for me personally, I think about the people that are my colleagues and we might miss that middle level so i just think that that's an important voice that we might want to reach out to too probably are like there's probably things going on that i don't know about but just throwing that out there thank you john point well taken anybody any board colleagues uh have any questions or concerns about the the finance meeting or the financial expectations part of the board meeting in march Awesome. Well, like I said, there's a lot of uh, wonderful reading for those who can't sleep in the FYIs. No, seriously, if you want to know about the, the CARES Act funding um, that we've received and how some of it's been spent, there's a memo in the FYI of the agenda for that. Um, and uh, the list of bills, the fee collection, CPI update, transportation update, and the revenue and expenditure update from December 2020 um, are all listed there. And I will adjourn this meeting at 8.51. All right, well, we have our working board meeting to jump right into. Um, Adila, do we need to do roll call again um, for open session? Yes, let's start. Um, 51, um, Monday, February 8th, 2021. This is the working board meeting. Um, Lindsay Ryan. Here. 
Mendoza? Here. Kartha? Here. Hilpern? Here. Kim? Here. Hernandez? Here. Tanya Vudi? Here. Thank you, Adela. Uh, so, yeah, apologies for um, running behind. We are significantly behind on the timeline that we had anticipated for our meetings this evening. But thank you for everyone who is staying engaged with these important conversations. Um, due to the governor's executive order, suspending certain Open Meetings Act requirements in order to comply with the state of emergency, the District 65 Board of Education will be conducting virtual board and committee meetings. Um, is Rebecca? Oh, yeah, you're still yep. there. Yep. Uh, I move that the Board of Education approve tonight's meeting agenda as presented. Second. Lindsay Ryan. Yes. Mendoza. Yes. Artha. Yes. Hilpern. Yes. Kim. Yes. Hernandez. Yes. Tanya Vudi. Uh, yes. Great. Motion passes seven zero. So next on our agenda this evening is um, public comments. And we have uh, any member of the public wishing to submit a comment to be read at the February 8th, 2021 board meeting was asked to email their comment to board secretary Kureshi A at district65.net by 5.30 this evening. Please note that it is not customary for the board to respond to public comments at the board meeting. The best way to correspond with members of the board is by emailing schoolboard at district65.net. Great, I'll begin with um, the first public comment. We have several for tonight. The first comment is from Abdul Shakur. Uh, he says, I was walking by my fourth grade daughter's Zoom class last week and heard them talking about being unapologetically Black. It was Black Lives Matter week in District 65 and I was feeling curious, so asked her about it. You said something about being unapologetically Black. I said, what exactly does that mean to you? Without hesitation, she answered, it means not having to apologize for being who you really are. Hmm, I said, but what if people don't really understand who you are? I don't have to apologize, she said. Not even a little bit? No. I offer that moment to speak to how much I appreciate my children's teachers, our schools, and this district as they navigate the, this pandemic while trying to keep the well-being of Black children at the center of the academic conversation. We're doing so much better than we were even just a few years ago. Now more than ever, I feel like the district leadership is more closely aligned to our family's affirming vision of black life and possibility. None of this is perfect and looks different in every classroom and every home, but I value what they are working so hard to do. This work isn't complete, but make no mistake that it's being done thoughtfully and with care. So thanks, Abdul Shakur, parent of a fourth grade for, and first grader at Oakland Elementary's ACC program. The next comment we have is from Tom, Tom Stanton. Reading the article in Princeton now about District 65 wanting to redraw school boundaries sparked me to reach out. The idea for one more major issue to be added to an already chaotic scenario is troubling. A pandemic has kept our schools closed for nearly a year. We have a new superintendent working to get his footing. Social justice has abruptly replaced math and science as the featured curriculum. Budget is sunk just a few years after an expensive referendum was pitched to the community as the fiscal solution for years to come. Enrollment is dropping as families transfer out. Mid-crisis is not the time to reamp the school boundaries. I appreciate the value in a progressive agenda. This is Evanston, but the direction and timing of our school district appears tone deaf to the current level of social anxiety. Plenty of people want to be a part of the conversation, constructive solutions, but allowing an echo chamber in the district is the opposite of progressive. 
I want our leadership to succeed, but please address the significant issues at hand and focus on restoring stability and earning trust. It's Tom Stanton of Evanston. The next comment we have is from Stephanie Kimmel. Um, Stephanie Kimmel is a resident of District 65 and lives in the village of Skokie in the Walker Shoot attendance area. She says, I read the memo regarding student assignment with interest, and I'm glad to see this issue is being discussed. I also noted the references to the population of Evanston with no reference to Skokie. Also, the memo included reference of ward-specific town hall meetings. Please remember that we Skokie residents do not live in wards, and please don't forget the voice of the families who live in Skokie. One solution would could, which could help with building a new school is closing road school which is approximately two blocks from Walker School and is one of the smaller enrollment schools. Another option is to consider closing Orrington, which is an old and outdated building. But both of these properties are likely high, highly marketable for redevelopment with the housing market so strong right now. Let's also at the same time reconsider dropping the magnet concept. The word magnet implies better to many families since our neighboring districts use this same term for selective of enrollment. The idea of a laboratory, which launched as Martin Luther King Jr. Laboratory School, seems to have outlived its usefulness for District 65. Thank you, Stephanie Kimmel. The next comment is from Mary Bowman. She says, I was disappointed to read about the decision for District 65 to suspend instrumental music due to the return to on-site learning and the implementation of the hybrid model. In a year when our children have already given up so much, it was disheartening that the district did not, have a, did not have a plan that included this program continuing. With months to prepare and plan for reopening, did the school administration not realize until recently that class sizes would be smaller and the district would need more adult supervision in each building? Why not recruit and fill these additional roles over the past few months prior to actually returning to school, rather than sacrifice the arts program for our children? Some might say that orchestra is just an extracurricular activity, but there's plenty of research to show that music and the arts are so much more, that students who participate in music programs show improved memory and score higher on testing. Beyond academic performance, learning to play an instrument has been proven to be a healthy way to relieve stress, anxiety, and keep depression at bay, a growing concern many parents have for their children after this challenging year with the pandemic. Virtual lessons have been helpful over the past year, but even those end in the current District 65 plan. Sure, some families can afford to pay for additional private lessons for their child, but many cannot. Let's, let's take this opportunity to create equity within our schools and invest in well-rounded student programs that continue, that continue will make our community culture great. Thank you, Mary Bowman. The next comment is from Bridget Wild. Dear District 65 community, I submitted a letter for the record back in December sharing my fears as a frontline pediatric provider witnessing the fallout for, our, for children experiencing profound isolation amid a rage, raging and unprecedented pandemic and calling us all to action to bring the best signs and people together to safely bring kids back to in-person learning. Today I'm writing from a place of deep gratitude and respect for every D65 administrator, teacher, facility, staff, and support services as I have had the privilege to spend countless hours bearing witness to their efforts to make this first step back into our buildings with care. Thank you, Drs. Horton, Green, Calgati, D. Cristofaro, and Beardsley, Terrence Little, Melissa Messenger, Bernice Judd, Raphael Obafemi, and your entire teams for your unwavering leadership and vision. Thank you for fostering a spirit of collaboration from the beginning and for graciously welcoming so many perspectives, my own included, even inviting careful critique and opening multiple channels of information, sharing to promote accountability and shared success of the hybrid start implementation. Thank you, Natalie Copper, Don Jackson, Meg Creeley, Dana Smalley, and Omar White for your compassion, persistence, and ownership of how these plans impact your colleagues and our students. Thank you to every person on the Medical Advisory Committee who bravely lent us their fears and perspective. And thank you to my medical colleagues for selflessly answering this rare call, infusing medicine and pediatric advocacy into our public school system. 
The vigor, the vigor and intensity of this interprofessional effort makes me proud to be a member of this community. Finally, the biggest thank you to our educators and school staff for all of the ways you have been and will continue to meet students' needs every day. You are nurturing and shaping all of our tomorrows. We have the benefit of knowing our plan incorporates the most important elements for safety. There is ample peer reviewed perspective data about how effective mitigation measures like masking, hand washing, and physical distancing are to prevent spread of COVID in schools. Our facilities are ready with optimized ventilation. Our cleaning plans are beyond thorough and our health protocols are fully aligned with public health guidelines. The verdict of these plans is not yet written. Our collective safety and success rests with each of us to buy in and protect ourselves and each other in and out of school. But we cannot do this and the time is right. But, oh, sorry, but we can do this and the time is right. We are implementing our first iteration of in-person learning since last March at a time our local positivity rates are extremely low with space to learn the best ways to enforce the key measures and safely scale up. In the coming months, as most schools across the country return to models of in-person learning, we will only have more granularity about what can be done safely. This pandemic has taught us all to expect the unexpected. Individually, we may be tired, broken, struggling, but together we are better, wiser, and we'll get through this. There are sure to be new twists and changes ahead, and I have confidence and gratitude that our district will be adept at staying two steps ahead. Sincerely grateful, Bridget Weil, MD, Pediatric Hospitalist, uh, D65 Medical Advisory Member, and mother of three. The next comment we have is from Lee Clifford. Lee Clifford says, I read with great surprise a recent local article stating that the district is considering hiring more consultants to study redrawing school orders. Our children have not entered a D65 school building in a year. By your own admission, nearly 11 months into this pandemic, you have as of yet been unable to figure out how to accommodate Evanston's children for a regular school day or a regular school week. Middle school parents are despondent as you have offered no timetable for many to return to classrooms at all. What communication or transparency has there been with the community about this massive new undertaking? Perhaps if you have taken more time to communicate in an open forum with the community, you might have a better sense of what parents want right now. They need you to get our school kids back in school full time, five days a week. They need you to show it can be done safely. They need you to advocate for vaccines for teachers and at risk families. Then they need you to address the learning loss that has occurred during the year when schools were closed. Frankly, spending money we don't have on more consultants to assess borders and projected attendance in coming years is particularly nonsensical this year, as many working families I know are waiting to see what plans you're putting in place for fall 2021. What are the plans? Will our kids be in school all day? Will you find extra space to accommodate all who want to come back? Will there be school on Mondays? These are the questions you and the board need to be spending your time on. It is a recipe for failure when organizations and leaders spread themselves thin trying to take on multiple and disparate projects. Please refocus your efforts on our children and start the long process of rebuilding trust with the community. Signed, Lee Clifford. Um, and the next comment we have is from Dr. Sharon Robinson. Dear District 65 board members, I hope that this letter finds you well. I am an Evanston resident, pediatrician, and more importantly, a D65 parent. I was asked by Dr. Horton to join the Medical Advisory Board to help advise the district on the safety of their reopening plans, and I very willingly agreed to do so. I am painfully aware of the negative rhetoric directed toward Dr. Horton and the school board that has surfaced over the past 10 months. Parties on both sides of the in-person learning debate have allowed their fears, anxiety, and anger to overcome them, resulting in a disheartening array of negativity, name calling, and threats. I have lived in Evanston for over 20 years and I have never witnessed such appalling behavior in our town. I thought we were better than this and I found myself deeply saddened and disheartened, a sentiment I am sure I share with many of you. 
It was therefore important to me that I express my deep gratitude to Dr. Horton, the D65 administrative team, and the school board for your thoughtful and comprehensive reopening plan. When I joined the advisory board, I will admit that I completely underestimated your team. To my pleasant surprise, what was presented to us was one of the most robust plans that I have come across in my research. It is clear that countless hours have been dedicated to ensuring that our staff and students have a safe space to return to in-person learning. This pandemic has been traumatizing for all of us in various ways. As a pediatrician, I have worked tirelessly to help distraught families navigate these uncharted waters with no compass, all the while trying to maintain my own safety and sanity. Dr. Horton and his team have done the same, enduring baseless attacks and misplaced anger. Despite the adversity, because of our oath to advocate for our patients and students, we have persevered. I like, so I, like so many other parents, am grateful for Dr. Horton's bravery, leadership, and unyielding support for the entire District 65 family. It is my sincere hope that Evanston residents will learn from this experience that compassion, empathy, and resilience are the tools we need to move forward. It is time to heal, forgive, and restore our faith in one another. Thank you, Dr. Horton and team for leading the way. Sincerely, Sharon Robinson, MD, proud District 65 parent. Our next comment is from Shelley Murphy. Hello, school board members. My question pertains to the topic of middle school math and the proposed new approach. My daughter is in fourth grade in the district. Over the past year, I have had a lot of opportunities to observe her school since it has been online. One thing I have noticed is the extremely wide range of student math competency. My daughter's current teacher addresses this range for the most part by dividing the children into different breakout rooms on the Zoom platform. This is possible because there are usually three to four adults for a class of only about 15 students. I was wondering how the proposed new middle, middle school approach will address the breadth of student needs in mathematics if the idea is in, is in class differentiation, how will this be achieved in an efficient manner so that it does not require several teachers per classroom? How will the proposed new math approach work at the transition to high school? Will it allow for a district supported pathway for students to enter high school at different levels? Um, one more, one final thought. On the subject of the proposed changes to middle school math, I understand that the busing costs for geometry are part of the justification for the proposed changes. I wonder if given the district's enhanced abilities to use remote platforms, there's a way to expand rather than contract access to geometry in the eighth grade by offering a single district-wide remote learning eighth grade geometry course. Thanks, Ch Shelley Murphy. The next question is from Todd Murphy. I would like to ask the following question of the board. What is the specific anticipated pathway to multivariate calculus by the end of high school for students interested in STEM once they attend college? If this will involve extracurricular activities like summer school, how will the district support underserved populations participating? Best, Todd Murphy. Our next uh, comment, uh, just a moment, is from Susan Phillips. Susan Phillips writes, as a black woman whose aptitude for math enabled me to be the first student in my public high school's 100 year history to go to Harvard, I urge you in the strongest possible terms not to terminate the District 65 math acceleration program. I know firsthand how achievements in mathematics can allow girls, Black and Latinx students, and students from lower socioeconomic backgrounds to gain admission to universities, programs, and fields in which they have traditionally been woefully underrepresented. But I also know firsthand how a school district's limited curricular offerings can disadvantage its students, mostly, particularly, its already disadvantaged students. Because my underfunded huge public high school offered a limited math curriculum equivalent to the already accelerated curriculum to which the district now proposes to reduce its offerings, I arrived at Harvard a year behind my peers in the STEM fields and a more than a year behind in mathematics, my chosen major, a year behind as a black girl in the sciences, not because of my own aptitude or the dedication of my amazing teachers, but because my school district did not offer the courses I needed to compete with my white privileged peers across the country. 
while I understand why my underfunded school in Florida, which at the time at that time was ranked 48th among the 50 states in public education, was in this predicament, I urge D65 not to follow the same diminished path. Given our resources and our commitment, we can and must do better. I recognize the equity, equity issues that you all are trying to address here. Our collective disappointment that this program has only modestly increased the number of black and brown students taking AP courses and the sense that the achievement gap is starkly represented in the disparity between the number of black and brown students and students from lower socioeconomic backgrounds participating in the program compared to their white and wealthier peers. A stark reminder of how wide the achievement gap is from the moment students enter school in kindergarten. But the proposal does not make clear beyond its aspirational rhetoric, how terminating this program will not erase these albeit modest gains further reducing the number of black and brown students in AP classes, nor does it address the detrimental effect, effect that terminating the program will have on black and brown students who would have been part of the program whose opportunities to achieve in mathematics and to compete with their wealthier white peers outside Evanston will have been considerably diminished. But simply, I am deeply concerned that terminating this program will widen the achievement gap for our students. I recognize that there are multiple ways pathways to reach multivariable calculus by senior year. The level of math expected for STEM programs at public and private universities alike. But none of those options include achieving this pathway through regular coursework in school. Indeed, they require summer school courses, external and internal exams, external programs, and other avenues that require the ability and the time. Um, to navigate the system and its options. While I can help my son navigate these pathways, I know that my own parents would not have been able to help me. I recognize that math acceleration program does not help the majority of Black and Latinx students, and that so much more has to be done in preschool and in K through two to ensure that that all our that all of our students are able to reach Common Core standards and expectations. We can and must do better. Black and, uh, however, given the invaluable opportunity this program provides for exceptionally talented black and brown students, I urge you in the strongest possible terms not to terminate. I feel certain there are ways to provide transportation funding so that it would become a budget neutral item. I know there are committed parents in our district who would help make that a possibility for all students in the program, regardless of their household income. And most importantly, we need to ensure that we are living up to our ideal, every child, every day, whatever it takes. Yours sincerely, Susan Phillips. Our comments can continue with a comment from Elizabeth Crouch. Dear Dr. Horton and D65 board, I'm writing this evening with a request for transparency into community feedback collected from the recent thought exchange. In participating in this forum, it seemed that the vast majority indicated financial prudence and safe return to school as the top priorities. I am subsequently left confused by the new priority of redrawing school borders at present time. Mitigating the declining enrollment seems vital to the district's financial outlook, and I do not believe that redistricting at the current time will help this cause. Furthermore, I that a robust and safe return to school plan for all students should be the focus and utmost priority. While I applaud the district for the hybrid return to school model, there is significantly more work to be done to ensure a 2021-22 school year that allows all children who wish to attend school to enter our buildings and for our students and teachers to engage in full days and full weeks of instruction. Any and all new priorities will inevitably detract from this necessary work that the community has deemed vitally important. In an effort to foster greater transparency, please release the feedback and priority rankings, as well as the methodology from the recent thought exchange so that we can be assured that the community feedback is seen and, ally and aligns with current action being taken by the district. Thank you, Elizabeth Crouch. And um, the next comment is from Dietmar Baum. Dear Dr. Horton and members of the school board, looking at the top rated thought exchange suggestions, several topics seem to emerge. Cut down on consultants and administrators, don't cut down on teachers, and a little bit, not much further down the list, keep math acceleration. 
Nevertheless, this week's board memos proposed to get rid of math acceleration and to hire consultants to guide the process for redrawing attendance area boundaries. The board memo regarding math acceleration states that this year's student scores using Desmos barely went up. This is being sold as an argument for Desmos and the discontinuance of the math acceleration program because the performance was at least equally bad among all demographic groups. Also telling, the performance of the group that might be most impacted by the change, the 10% or so highest performers that would have been in previous years in the accelerated math program is not split out or mentioned at all. It does not seem to me that anybody suggests that the current setup in the elementary schools helps to decrease the achievement gap. Getting rid of math acceleration is very similar to continuing what has been done in K-5, so it is unclear why this should even stand a chance of reducing the achievement gap going forward. In the spring math map test for fifth grade, 210 points correspond to the 25th percentile of all students. 242 points to the 90th percentile and 259 points to the 99th percentile. 10 points are said to be equivalent to about one year of instruction. This means that the difference between a student in the 25th percentile and the 99th percentile is around five years of instruction. Differences of that size within one classroom will be very common without an accelerated math class. Nevertheless, the administration seems to imply that it is beneficial for all students to be in the same classroom and that it is possible for teachers to teach across such a wide range of levels. In reality, the high performing students will continue being partly bored and partly given exercises outside the curriculum. In our experience, this has included doing the same challenge mountains on STMAP for several years in a row, and being asked to do some next grade, some next grade work on Khan Academy. In our local elementary school, Orrington, around 10% of students in my son's grade have at least once scored in the 99th percentile in one of the math map tests. Why are there more students that are at the high performing at Orrington compared to some of the other elementary schools? Because of the proximity to Northwestern and Orrington's English as a foreign language learners program. A lot of Orrington parents are professors at Northwestern University or are foreigners like myself who have a higher degree in mathematics, science, or engineering. Indeed, a lot of the parents who will be most upset about the discontinuance of the math acceleration program will be foreigners from Germany, Israel, Russia, Morocco, and China, and many more countries all subsumed under the predictable, but for them potentially meaningless demographic category. The website that argues for the establishment of a fifth ward STEM school makes the point that it is necessary to close the US achievement gap versus other developed nations in math and science. It is ironic that at the same time, the district administration wants to terminate the math acceleration program. The only winners of getting rid of the math acceleration program will be the peers at New Trier and for-profit programs like Northwestern's Gifted Program and the Center of Talent Development. With kind regards, Dr. Dietmar Baum. And we have one last comment um, from Meg Curley. Dear District 65 Board of Education, DEC supports the middle school math recommendations in tonight's board memo. We value the collaborative process and detailed work involving our talented middle school math educators. The important conversations centered on acceleration, enrichment, curriculum, and instruction, and how to deepen mathematics learning for all students. These conversations between the middle school math educators and the district leadership that are centered on acceleration, equity, enrichment, curriculum, and instruction, and how to deepen mathematics learning for all students are critical to partnering in the best way to meet the needs of our students. Meg Curley, District 65 Education Council President. And that concludes the public comments for tonight. Thank you, Adila. Um, the next item on our agenda is um, uh, our discussion item, student assignment planning. Um, however, before we dig into that, uh, Sarita, I would like to read a board comment that I have prepared. Um, it's somewhat related to our discussion item, but um, also a general statement as well. Um, thank you. 
From the article, The Hidden Victims of Gaslighting by Rhea Waltenholm of the BBC. It says, gaslighting is defined as a manip manipulating someone into thinking they're wrong, even when they're right. A form of emotional abuse, it can be used to make the victim question their own mental well-being. Paige Sweet, an assistant professor of sociology at the University of Michigan, studies domestic abuse and believes gaslighting is deeply rooted in societal structure and social environments and, or social inequalities. Women are more likely to experience gaslighting both in the professional environments and in their personal lives due to these inequalities, she says. In early January, we as a board made our community aware of threats and a hate crime that had been directed towards members of our board and administration. Since we have seen a number of efforts to undermine our credibility and now to ask us to prove that we've experienced these threats and harms as if taking the time and vulnerability to name them, write about them, speak about them is not proof enough. As reported at our last convening as a board, 25% of the 24 FOIA requests were for proof of these threats. I want to name the impact of the inclination to demand that victims and the marginalized not only be brave enough to name and disclose the abuse that we are su subjected to, but also repeatedly discuss it in detail, not for the sake of repair of harm, but to prove harm occurred that impact, the impact of that is gaslighting. Is our energy as a community better used repeatedly dissecting the harm that has been done or correcting it? That's a rhetorical question, but to answer it, I believe our time and energy as a community are better served by being accountable to harm and committed to collective repair. I hope we can make those shifts and invite everyone to lean into that. Accountability can be uncomfortable and healing and repair unfamiliar, but for the sake of District 65 children and families, we must. Being repeatedly gaslit is exhausting and time consuming. We are committed to, stu to stewarding our district through the challenges ahead. We want our bandwidth and focus on both the short-term and long-term priorities of a safe reopening of schools, responsible financial management and decision-making as we address our structural deficit, addressing the gap in opportunity to achieve and working towards program alignment and equitable student assignment in our schools. With these critical and challenging conversations, that we are embarking on, we continue on a path of brave and bold leadership to steward institutional shifts and repair of historical and disproportionate systemic harms to vulnerable communities of District 65. Tonight, we will discuss the framework for beginning conversations about redistricting to alleviate the burden of busing on our most marginalized students and families and consider how to provide a fifth ward school that was taken away and denied again by a subset of our community only eight years ago. We will discuss how we approach rectifying what has been perceived as an intransigent problem of resolving a structural deficit. That in part is sustained by an adequate state funding of schools and has been exacerbated by the fiscal decisions of boards pass and the long-term institutional practice of not investing in marginalized communities and we, we will do this with transparency, inclusivity, accountability, repair, and community care at the fore. Though it may be challenging, we will not shy away from the work of stakeholder engagement and transparency on the front, of, on the front end of critical conversations. We will continue to move ahead with our community values to be our best and highest selves for each other, our children, our, and ourselves at the center. Thank you.
Um, and Dr. Horton, did you have uh, some comments that you wanted to make before we dive into discussion as well? Yes, I do. Yeah. Memories of our lives, of our works and our deeds will continue in others, Rosa Parks. As part of my comments this evening, I would like to publicly acknowledge the continuing harassment directed at board vice president, Biz Lindsay Ryan. In the wake of homophobic hate crime targeting her in January, because of Ms. Lindsay Ryan's commitment to challenging inequities and her vocal advocacy and action to prioritize the needs of historically marginalized communities, she continues to be subject to hateful social media posts, challenging not her work, but her integrity. I am, not, I am here to stand beside Ms. Lindsay, Lindsay Ryan, all members of the school board, administration, staff and parents who are putting themselves on the line to do the necessary and difficult work in writing decades of wrong. We can't say we're about equity here in District 65. We must be about it. It's more than just condemning acts of violence and hate. We must put our words into action in the form of dismantling policies and practices that have further marginalized those most in need of our support. We are committed to this work as evidenced in the discussion topics before us tonight. While the night may be long, it is important that we converse, that we have this discussion. I'm grateful for the strong leadership of the school board and their commitment to enact meaningful change for black and brown children and families in this community. Thank you for making it possible for us to do this work. Sarita. Thank you. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Thank you for that intro. Um, I am Dr. Horton. Um, so my name is Sarita Smith. I am here um, to present uh, the launching of our new um, student assignment plan. Um, so what, what is student assignments? Um, so currently we as a school district assign our families based on where they live. So we have all these markers and, and maps based on your address, you get assigned to a school. Um, and this leaves families with uh, limited school options or, and limited school choice. Um, the only other options to go to a different school other than the one that you are assigned to is through our lottery process for both magnet schools and magnet programs. Um, so we are hoping um, to shift what student assignments means uh, through a, a pretty long-term project. So student assignments to us um, moving forward really means to build a system that aligns with our values um, and our community and brings an uh, equitable lens and, for, and opportunity for all the students in District 65. So this year, or actually 2020, um, I was hired to, to lead this work. Um, and I put in its totality because it isn't just about um, a fifth ward school. It isn't just about redoing lines. We are truly looking at all the processes, all the procedures and um, what this could look like in a modernized structure um, and way and, and definitely um, fixing and addressing historical inequities that continue to impact um, our students of color and our most marginalized families. So what is the vision of this? Like, what is the end goal? So our, our end goal is really to create a comprehensive student assignment plan, which will include, but is not is not limited to new school boundaries and in essence, decreasing transportation costs, an equitable selection process for magnet schools and programs and a school for fifth ward families. So I think it's really, really important to understand where we came from um, in order to determine where we are going. So a little bit of a history lesson. Uh, we should all know that, you know, 1954 was an important year um, with Brown versus Board of Education, um, outlawing segregation of public education facilities for black students. Um, and then obviously right after that Civil Rights Act which has suspended all of our state and local laws requiring segregation. Um, and so what was happening in Evanston during, during this time? In the 63, uh, District, District 65 uh, created a voluntary transfer policy implemented to relieve overcrowding at both Foster and Dewey School. And this is where our infamous busing begins. Uh, in 64, once the Civil Rights Act passed, uh, the board put de desegregation as a policy, and that is when a lot of our shifts um, in our schools um, and our borderlines uh, started. 
So in 66 and 67 school year, um, one of those efforts was foster school becoming a laboratory school. Um, and this school was actually fully integrated. An important note here is that we actually bus white and Asian students to the fifth ward um, simultaneously while black students were being bused out. Um, so very interesting dynamic going on there in 66, 67. And then we also opened Kingsley School again for overcrowding reasons. So we were able to find some pretty cool maps, if my screen will work for me, um, on what our district looked like pre-segregation and then post. So this map um, shows schools that some of you may not be familiar with. Um, we have some schools in here that were closed throughout our history, uh, Miller and Central, College Hill, Timber Ridge used to be a, a local area school, um, and Noise. So these are some schools we'll kind of talk about over the course of this presentation. Post-segregation, we all know that um, Foster School ended up closing, um, and they were, um, the, the community was shifted into like six or seven different schools. Um, and I think an important note here is um, as we continue to think about and talk about the fifth ward um, and schools uh, that even though there were schools that were pretty close to proximity to the fifth ward, a lot of these students were kind of driven and bused um, to schools way far south, way far east and west of their home area. So then in, in the 70s, um, due to desegregation efforts, our enrollment dropped significantly in District 65. Um, at some point, we had like 10,000 students and it dropped by a couple thousand um, over the course of a pretty short amount of time. So obviously the district looked at boundary lines and decided that we needed to close some schools. So College Hill, Miller and Noyes ended up closing. Um, King Lab and Stiles, which was another middle school, ended up combining. Um, and by 79, ended up moving to the current location where King Arts is. And the decision to close Foster School was made in 1979 as well. Um, during that time, they also decided to close um, three other schools. They were looking at Timber Ridge, Central, and Kingsley. Timber Ridge ended up closing as a uh, local area school and turned into a magnet. Central closed. And Kingsley was one that the board had some pretty deep discussion um, on when they were, were looking at that because I, the communities around there, including Fifth Ward families, were arguing that then there is really no school even within proximity um, of their neighborhood. So there was a lot of questioning about that, a lot of debate. Kingsley ended up surviving and Foster School, as we noted, uh, did close. Um, in the 80s, there was just a lot of push and transparency from our board about creating this uh, established 60% guidelines, which is that no defined racial group should exceed 60% of a school population. And again, a lot of busing and a lot of movement of Fifth Ward families and Black and Brown communities to make that actuality. So uh, in the 70s, the early 70s, this is kind of what the map looked, at, looked like. Um, uh, you know, Timber Ridge again ended up closing and becoming a magnet school. So Walker uh, consumed that space in that um, area of Evanston. Uh, Central ended up closing. So Oakton and Washington uh, consumed a lot of that space. So you'll see over time as the map shifts that each every time a school closes, obviously another school kind of takes up um, that space and those families. In the 90s, it was a get back to the drawing board uh, again for the district. Um, and a lot of uh, everything after the 70s was really about overcrowding and racial balance. You'll kind of see that um, as a pattern um, in a lot of these maps. And so there was a lot of um, uh, small shifts to, to balance schools and, um, and, and balanced race in schools. And in the 2000s, we really shifted to uh, a program mindset to diversify schools. So uh, obviously in 2001, uh, the district opened TWE, our TWE immersion program at two schools. And since uh, then we've actually extended, expanded that to five. And then in 2006 and seven, we offered um, African-centered curriculum, also known as ACC um, at Oakton. So the board in the 90s were, um, I mean, pretty literal about their drawings. We found some pretty um, interesting drawings where they're literally scratching things out like, hey, if we shift this line this way, what it will look like. So that was revision one in 94, 95. We ended up getting something closer to revision two. 
in 94, 95, uh, for, which is actually pretty close to the current boundary lines that we have today. Um, uh, this map is, is specifically speaking towards the middle school population. I think it's worthy to note that even though through much of the 60s and 70s, we were shifting boundary lines for our K-5 population, the middle school map didn't shift that much. So again, talking about overcrowding and, and making sure that our, our, our schools were racially balanced, uh, a lot of that same consideration really didn't happen at the middle school level. And I hear a lot in the community and, and, and from our principals, you know, about like how many kids are coming and how, you know, how, what's the true uh, capacity of their schools. And it's just worthy to note that, you know, some of that is uh, uh, ramifications of us not really giving the same attention to middle school uh, lines as, as much as we did elementary. So here we are today, current maps, again, not very drastically different from that mid nineties map you saw, which also wasn't drastically different from the seventies map outside of some schools closing. Um, and we uh, have the infamous Willard Island, which we'll address in another map. So here we are, um, uh, a lot of talk about the fifth ward, a lot of talk about you know foster school closing. And I just wanted to take a minute um, to for you guys to, to visualize um, kind of where we are. Um, so. I'd also like to mention that there was a correction made in the board pre-read regarding wards and school inequities. There was a map uh, used that had an error on it. Um, and in that map, we stated that um, all the districts had a school except the fifth ward, which is, is not accurate. So uh, all of our schools have, a, 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 all of our, excuse me, wards have a school besides first and fifth. So first ward is here. There's no actual physical school building in first um, or there, or obviously in fifth. Um, and so as you can see, the colors are the um, schools and who they serve. So in your first ward, many of those uh, families and students attend Dewey, a small portion of them attend Orrington. Then you have your fifth ward where families are technically assigned to five different schools. The um, challenging part for the fifth ward families is that they actually attend every school in our district. So we have fifth ward families going all the way to Oakton and Dawes, up to Willard and to Walker and Skokie. I mean, they, they're literally accounted at every single school in our district. And some of that uh, is due to, you know, our special education services, you know, being only a limited school. Some is due to placement of programs like TWE and ACC. Um, and, and some, frankly, are, are due to families who just have felt so much adversity in some of the schools that they are assigned to that they uh, bluntly just refuse to attend. Um, and then we've had to make considerations for, for them to feel safe and, and um, wanted in our district. Um, so again, still currently, shoot, uh, our, our middle schools, um, again, hasn't shifted that much. Uh, so why now? Why are we doing this now? So obviously, uh, one, one reason is our policy. We are actually supposed to look at these lines uh, annually um, and make recommend recommendations to the board, um, you know, every year. So I am a very policy-driven person. So it was one of the first things I looked at um, uh, when I got into this role. Uh, the inequities um, are jarring. They are not new. A lot of this information people know already. Um, and to Dr. Horton's point, uh, we are not just going to talk about inequ inequities and, and how to build an equitable education system. We're, we're going to do something about it. Um, so we understand that this is a long-term project, um, but we really have to get around um, and, and rectify this perception of good and bad schools in the district, which we hear in my office a lot. Uh, we have to address our fifth ward uh, students um, and, and the fact that they attend every school in the district. Like, what does that say about our priorities and how we prioritize them? Um, and, you know, our, we have the two wards that are the wealthiest in our district and have the most resources, have the most schools. So there's something that, that doesn't sit right about that, and we, we need to address that. We are also going to be doing a master facility plan and what better time to talk about school uh, location options and, and assignments than uh, coupled with a master's facility plan, which um, I am super excited about, especially the fact that they're going to analyze capacity and school utilization uh, so we can really determine if we have to shift anything, what, um, how that relates to uh, what schools can actually handle. And then our population, which um, was brought up earlier, we are, we are decreasing in size in the district. Um, we, we totally understand that this number here is an anomaly because of COVID, um, but even our projections as early as 18, 19 and last year were still showing us um, on a decline. 
uh, over the next five years. Um, we also have um, some census data that um, is stating that our population in Evanston is decreasing and we'll be looking at the new census data that is coming out. Um, and there's even some national data over the next 30 years that's showing that um, the, the baby making population is also um, not doing that as much anymore. So we wanna be prepared um, and again, fiscally responsible about how we um, navigate this process. So over the past few months, it's really just been about planning. Um, like, how do we do this? How do we uh, get a team of people that is gonna support this work in our community? And so here's all the staff at District 65 that I've probably met with way too much and I've probably bothered way too often, um, but thanking them for their support and um, helping us visualize this in um, a strategic and, and sensible way. Um, and how, how do we do this? So student assignment, uh, Phase one is really just, it was about reviewing our systems, which I've been doing since I got here and our policies and procedures related to student assignment and um, any information that's currently out there from the community. I've met with several community leaders, uh, particularly people that have tried this before and the group that got it on the ballot um, a few years ago. So just trying to understand the landscape. Um, obviously we need to establish some deadlines and establish uh, our, our, work, an in, our internal working team. And then the student advisory, uh, assignment advisory committee application is being developed and uh, we've created a selection metrics for that. So we are going to be asking uh, for our community members to join us in this. This is not just an internal district decision. This is not just an internal district process. Uh, we are going to be collecting people in our community to help us understand and realize this. So phase two, uh, we'll be doing some goal setting. Uh, we'll be uh, doing our application, our SAC selections. Uh, there will be more surveys. We know we'll try to um, condense these for you guys, but some community and parent and staff surveys on this because we know opinions will be uh, large and, and vast and we want all that information so we can synthesize it. We will be um, engaging with our superintendent's youth advisory team because I, you know, I'm coming from the nonprofit world, and uh, you know, youth voice and choice is really important. Um, and so often we adult and don't ask the kids what they want. So it's really important for us to to get their voices heard. We will be doing ward specific town halls because we. Um, believe that we really need the, the input of our community. Uh, so based on the survey, we may have some questions that we need to go further and deeper about, and we will then take those uh, questions and bring them to the town hall. So we have a very clear understanding um, and specificity about what uh, you know families need and want in, in a school and community space. And then, uh, you know, probably way too much data analytics for, for me to get into. Um, phase three, uh, hopefully uh, around the fall or, or even early um, winter, the master facilities plan uh, will help uh, inform our recommendations and get some information from them. Uh, we'll be doing a, a little bit of a different thing with community feedback forms. So yes, we're doing a survey. Yes, we're doing town halls, but we'll have a landing page um, on our district website that will, um, be a place that where you can ask continuous questions and continuously uh, converse with us, um, the, us being the working team. So we don't want it to be a, a kind of one and done, like we ask you your opinion and, and we never hear back from you. We really want this to be a, um, um, an ongoing process and ongoing communication um, and, and to be fully transparent about what we can and can't do. So some phenomenal things may come out of these town halls and surveys and we may come back and say like, that sounds amazing we can't do that right now, or that sounds amazing. Here's how, here's portions of it that we we're going to, you know, continue to work towards. Uh, so again, just don't want anything to be a surprise by the time we um, present board recommendations. Um, so a little bit about our, um, our call to action and what we're going to be asking for of our, our SAC committee. So I am going to read this. Um, our call to action is that all students should have the right to a local area school high quality education, high quality programs, and high quality teachers that are proximate to their homes and neighborhoods. We must ensure that all families have the opportunity to actively participate in their students' education without barriers. This should be our commitment to all students in District 65. 
So if that spoke to you in any kind of way, I am pleading and begging and asking you to apply for our committee. So the Student Advisor Assignment Advisory Committee application will be going live soon. We are looking for 30 people who are passionate about uh, school equity and believe that all students have a right to equitable and quality uh, education experience. So 10 of these people will be District 65 ed educators and administrators. We need 10 representatives from the community um, across all genres and areas, uh, you know, community youth, youth agencies, leaders, community institutions, older person. Uh, you know, I, I'd love to have the input of uh, families and or, or staff from family focus and youth serving agencies, religious based organizations our local colleges and university. Um, and I'd really, really uh, appreciate some, a few representatives from the Citizens for a Better Evanston who got uh, the fifth war school on the ballot uh, last go around. And then of course our District 65 parents, um, again, as, as 10 people, so as, as wide of a school variety as possible. So this application we plan for it to go live February 15th. I know it's right around the time where schools are opening too. So we're throwing a lot at you guys. Uh, we will um, hopefully, send this out in a, a vast communication way. So um, anyone who is willing and wanting to um, get on here, uh, apply, could do that. And we'll, we hope to do all of our selections before spring break and then our work will begin. Um, and I am also uh, asking two board members to be uh, a part of this committee. And the staff surveys and community surveys are on the horizon. So I'll end with, um, this beautiful picture of a Sankofa bird, which um, as you can see on the title says, go back and get it. Um, I think there is a, a remarkable opportunity for us to right our wrongs and fix the inequities that we've had around education and student assignments in the district uh, before we can then go forward and talk about other parts of this, this process. Um, so we are really this bird uh, is uh, a symbolization from Ghana that translates to go back and get it. Um, it characterizes the need to reflect on our past in order to build a successful future. Um, this work is going to be significant. It's going to be emotional. It's going to be challenging, but every parent wants the best for their child. Um, and we can no longer prioritize some, some parents and some families and some students over others. Uh, as, as we really push to build an equitable system, um, we have to modernize this system. There are some really cool examples out there that we've been looking at that I've heard about since starting this work and talking internally um, that I think would really uh, lend to our vision. Um, and we have to fix the inequitable structures that we have put in place, particularly for our fifth ward residents. So I hope this body of work creates choice for parents and truly, truly is reflective of our Evanston population. And I will take your questions now. Thank you, Sarita, for all the great work. I want to say that uh, there's, been, there's been quite a bit of work uh, done to get to this point, so thank you. Thank you. Come on, Suni. I was going to say, <laughs> can I go ahead and jump in? <laughs> I know um, you got something. I am so, thank you for that presentation. I was so thrilled to read this memo. I was so thrilled to see the presentation, um, I think. <laughs> You know, I was on the Citizens for a Better Evanston Advocacy Committee, and that's what drove me to want to be a member of the school board was to finally get to the point where we're sitting here and having this conversation. So I am just thrilled. Um, so thank you. <laughs> uh, and thank you, Dr. Horton, for, for leading this and, and uh, you know, making this a priority. I know we have gotten some, some questions, and I, I know that there were some commenters uh, earlier who were wondering, why are we taking this on now when there's already so much change and so much upheaval. Um, my perspective is this is the exact right time when there has been so much upheaval. And we know, uh, you know, COVID has, you know, it's kind of cliche and I know we've heard it in a number of instances, but, but it's exposed a lot of the inequities and what's wrong. And instead of just going back and becoming complacent with how things were, because for some people that's comfortable, we should take this as an opportunity to, um, to shake things up and, and to correct some wrongs. Um, so I, I think this, there, I don't think there could be better timing to have, be having this conversation. Um, I, what, one question that I had, well, a couple of questions that I had um, 
One is on the, you said that there's a trend of declining enrollments, which I know we have seen uh, for the past couple of years at least. I do wonder the, the projections that you showed us, is that taking account the dip this year because of COVID? So I guess what I'm saying is I know that in the past we've had some challenges as a district to have accurate projections and we haven't always been, been right and it's, it's caused us some problems. Um, how much is COVID impacting the existing projections and is there anything we can do to accurately account for the, the decline due to the pandemic? Yeah, uh, that's a that's a great question. And I mean, Kylie uh, trained me well on how to do our projections and how we do them uh, currently. And you know, our our logic, it you know, there's obviously error rates, right? Um, and you need some some margins of error that's going to happen there. Um, I actually looked at 2018, 19, five years projections too to see like how close it was. Um, it's pretty close, <laughs> even with this kind of 300 ish kid variant that we have currently this year because of COVID. So even if we added 300 more kids on there. Not only are we, um, if we don't decline that much, we'll at least be stable for the next five years. Uh, so this is not showing any indication of growth. And I think um, our um, the census data that's gonna come out this year will be really, really critical into saying like, so here's what like our projections are and then here's Evanston census data. And then they'll give us five year and 20 and 30 year projections as well. So we're really trying to hold tight until we get that April information because that's really going to uh, help us determine if we are like at a stable amount of, of kids or if we're truly declining over time. So luckily for us, timing again, like census data is coming out. So that'll really help us. Um, I did some national census kind of digging. And again, like the baby making population isn't really doing much <laughs> right now. Uh, they're Netflix and, and that's about it, right? Like they're not having a bunch of babies. So uh, there's some data around that, that, that the population really just isn't growing right right now um, and that you know they're they're focused on career they're not like focused on you know marrying right away like you know they're not like me I you know settled down early they aren't they're they're a little different so uh, hopefully with census information that's coming out April we'll have a little more accuracy because uh, I know we pulled some information from Evanston Public Library who pulls it from the census so just waiting to get a little a little better accuracy from them on the numbers okay that sounds great and I, I assume too will I mean, I have no idea what Evanston's census, uh, I know that nationally there are concerns about the upcoming census and how accurate it's gonna be. So right. I, I, you know, we have to take that into account as well, but yeah. it sounds like you're, you're thinking through all of these questions. The only other question that I, I had immediately, cause I know we are just at the planning stage and there's, you know, obviously still, th this is the first in a yeah. long conversation. Um, yeah. But one thing that I know was considered uh, at least a few years ago, was um, really shaking up even just, you know, instead of looking at K-5 and middle school to even further, um, you know, look at like K through two centers and three through five and six through eight. Is that still, I mean, is kind of everything still on the table or is it I'll really- take it. Let me take that, Sarita. Yeah. K through five, okay. So, so uh, you know, SUNY, yes. So that is a little bit ahead of the process, but absolutely. Uh, we are open to um, all of it, you know, right? And, and as we think about, and we form the committee and advisory group, we'll look at different models and samples. And you're absolutely right, Sonia. That is something, you know, as a superintendent, what I have to prevent myself from doing is jumping out and saying, yeah, let's, let's want to make these changes. So we want to use this advisory group the right way. Uh, but I'm sure that those uh, scenarios definitely will be on the table uh, okay. for us. No, not trying to get ahead of anything, just kind of what are yeah. we really talking about, you know, kind of looking at it from scratch and it yes. sounds like we are, so yes. that's great. Thank you. Thank you, did I see? Yeah, no, uh, sorry, uh, I just wanna thank you and the team, your team for, you know, getting getting together and, and creating, you know, I, I again, I, I'm, I'm such a fan of making sure that we're always looking at the history because this work isn't new, right? I mean, the work towards equity, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, in Spanish, we say, call la lucha, the struggle. You know, the struggle has been going for, for a while, right? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and you know, you, you are, your example of how you, you kind of broke, you, I love the memo, how you broke down the history of it is just incredible uh, and really, really beneficial because we need to know, right, that, 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 that there is a history to this. Yeah. And they, there's been attempts 
Uh, and, and here's the latest attempt. And, and I just really want to acknowledge and, and, and thank you for giving us that historical context so we can, so then we have a, a clear path, right, uh, to, to moving forward, knowing what we have seen in the past. So that I think is, just, is phenomenal. Uh, you know, one of the things I, I, I think about, and it was mentioned in one of the comments is, you know, again, we know that across the, across the country, you know, we're seeing declining enrollments, right, and what the impact of that is. So, um, you know, one of the, that's, that's one of my concerns, I think. And, and what I hear a lot is, you know, what I'm seeing and hearing is, you know, for instance, there's folks who are just not either they're homeschooling or they're for the little ones, for instance, a pre-K, kindergarten, they're just keeping their kids home. They're not, you know, they, they're just going to wait another year or until the, the COVID blows over. So just really making sure that I think it's, and this is an ask for the whole team, right? To making sure that we keep track of those declining enrollments to make sure, and, and then we, and it's, I would imagine most of those are our are, are most marginalized families, our black and brown families who are, who are keeping their kids at home, right? Uh, with, especially with their pre-K and little ones, right? Mm -hmm. uh, another thing too, you know, you know, given that we are seeing these declining enrollments, it makes me think about the broader context and how things that happen outside of the school walls impact our enrollment. So, you know, we know that Evanston is, is, a, is a very expensive community to live in. Um, you know, again, we have families who, again, immigrant families who have doubled up. Um, and, you know, part of what I'm hearing around the decline in enrollments is that is our most marginalized families are either moving away to double up with other family members because they can't afford to live here. Right. Or, um, you know, or, or again, just barely struggling to, 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 to hold down to stay in this place. Uh, I know I'm, I'm part of a multi-generational family. So we have my mother-in-law who, who lives with us, right? So, you know, that, that I think as you take into account and as you look at, um, you know, you know, have these conversations, you know, really making sure that somebody from the city of Evanston is part of the conversation, um, you know, and, re, uh, uh, and folks from Chamber of Commerce and the real estate folks. I really love how you really point out how, again, even though there's law, you know, to, to, to desegregate schools for Brown versus Board and the Civil Rights Act, that privileged people and what, privileged white folks and some of our privileged color folks vote with their feet and they ask what the good schools are and we know what that means. Right. So, you know, that, that they don't want to be with working class folks or live near us. Um, so, again, diversity is good for some folks, but only to a certain extent. Right. Um, so just being, uh, you know, I, I, I thank you for your honesty, uh, because I think that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with not only decades, but centuries of that right. of this colonial mindset of, of, of thinking lesser of us and, and, and of people uh, who have been marginalized and colonialized and desecrated. So, you know, I, I'm excited for this work to happen. Uh, I would be, part, uh, you know, I will be, I will volunteer myself to be part of that uh, SAC I, committee. I was just about to say, Sergio, you sound like you want to be on the I am. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, it's going to be a fight, Sergio. I think we're yeah. going to have to come up with a process <laughs> to figure out yeah. who it's going to be. Yeah, I think a lot of us want to help out. Competition. <laughs> yeah. competition. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, I got, I got a, tons of stuff going on. So again, I take this as a tentative because <laughs> I put the, <laughs> my schedule, but yeah, it won't be much of a fight, but we'll see. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sure intimidated by arm wrestling biz, but that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sergio. I appreciate the, the sentiment. So, oh, yes, Rebecca. Uh, thank you uh, for that very informative and needed uh, presentation. I'm curious if there's any way that we could just post that part of your of tonight's presentation to our website. Maybe it doesn't have to be the presentation tonight, but I think that um, for for many people, this might that this might be the first time that they're hearing this, right? And so I think that people who have lived here um, for as long as you and I have, we, we know a lot of that history, right? And we keep on repeating it, but there's new members to our community. Um, also members, you know, uh, immigrant people from in our community that didn't go through school here, right? So that don't have exposure to that history and why it's so important. So um, if there's any way that we can post just that, you know, that section of your of your presentation, I think that that would be really beneficial um, just as a, as a general history um, of, of our district. I think that there's um, great value to that. Um, I do also want to point out that this didn't just get added to our docket. This was part of our of our yearly planning. So this was presented to us. We knew that it was going to be on um, on the docket since last spring. So for anybody who feels like we're just adding this on, believe me, uh, we are not. We are not 
you know, uh, we're not trying to torture ourselves with that. It's, it's a lot of work, right? So we didn't just say, you know, let's add this on top of our already um, high workload. So just, you know, to, to let the community know that this has been um, part of our work since, um, since last spring. And also invite um, not just, you know, to this uh, committee, but also the, it will be, um, we've been working on the policy um, for this, and that's going to be discussed at April uh, 12th policy meeting, I believe. So I encourage the, the community to, to join us on that. We don't have as many policy meetings, again, because it's been a really busy year um, for our school district. But I do want to encourage um, members of the community to attend that meeting. Uh, that memo has been out in part of a previous packet um, and it will be included in the, in the packet for um, for April. But just um, again, I think it's a it's it's a conversation that's been needing needed to happen in our community for a long time. And so for those who might feel impatient that um, at, at, the, at the timing, just know that it's it's something that has to be that has to be done. And so uh, this is this is the time. So it's not, I didn't really have a question, just wanted to say um, thank you for the presentation, great job and invite uh, the community to not only um, those who are interested in participating in this um, in this committee, but also to keep, um, to know that it, it was already on the docket to, to discuss. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks Rebecca. Joey? Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, you told that story very well. And it was, uh, I, I liked Rebecca's idea of uh, cropping it and making it available for other people to listen to. Um, it was very engaging. It was clear. It had visuals. Um, I went to Timber Ridge School <laughs> for kindergarten. Um, hallways were still small and narrow. Um, but I think in the history that you told, you also normalize this uh, for us and for the community. This is something that has to be done every couple of decades. Um, you have to recalibrate around your community, around who lives there and who goes to your schools. And uh, this is something that has happened every couple of decades for a long time uh, here in District 65. And um, we need to do that. And it can be tied into, um, it can be tied into our budget process, our finance, our long-term fiscal health. It can be tied into making all of our schools better places. You talk about the permissive transfer process. Um, all of our schools should be great schools for all of our kids to go to. And everyone should be proud to be able to go to any one of them. And you shouldn't hear those murmurs in, in, in buildings or offices anywhere. Um, so thank you for setting the stage for the work. Uh, I guess my only real question is, and it may not be able to be answered tonight um, is what's the budget for this project? Because um, this, a long-term project like this does take, uh, people are gonna knock consultants, but you know we don't have civil engineers on staff. Um, it does take um, consulting work to bring people in to assess the value of properties and kind of do the due diligence to, to do this long-term. Um, and is there, a time at which a budget for this will be set for for that time frame that the project will be set. Yes, uh, we will be we will be able to do that. Uh, I would say safely uh, as early as next month. Um, well, actually, it'll probably end up being April because we would have to put out uh, a bid for um, for the services to do the um, facility study and the master planning. So um, by the time we get that, we'll know we'll have a better idea of what what it'll cost us to, to run the de demographic studies and all those things. So, all right. I would, I would be very much interested in um, when it goes time to choose partners to work with to help doing the, the massive facility studies um, to having possible suitors come and present their vision for that work uh, to the board in open session so that the community can hear from uh, the vendors and we can have a chance to to hear how they would approach this work and try to match the right vendor with the community as well. Absolutely, we could do that. Biz. Um, I wanna echo my gratitude um, for the way you cohesively put this together. I think that um, it's really important for our community to 
to see the demonstration of our commitment that this will not happen accidentally. This will not happen without intentionality and strategic planning and assessment of all sorts of components. Um, I, I think there's a tendency sometimes for people to see board work um, or district work as like these disparate things that are unrelated, like, oh, now we're talking about math and then now we're gonna talk about, um, you know, this other thing and that, that they don't have anything to do with each other. Whereas when our conversations about finances, our conversations about equity, our conversations about curriculum, these are all interdependent pieces. And when we are talking about, you know, kids having equitable experiences, we can't close our eyes to one aspect of what's happening for them. We have to be present and engaged and, and collectively problem solve all of these pieces. Um, and have kind of equity at the center of all of our decision making. And I think that, you know, for folks who aren't, you know, whose, whose job isn't to be in these conversations all the time, it can feel random, it can feel like, but wait. Um, but I want to echo, you know, SUNY's perspective of, I, I think we have, many people knew lots of things were not working before this pandemic, but we have an opportunity that more people are seeing what's not working. And I just, I, I can't imagine us deciding that we should go back to a way that was failing kids when we have an opportunity to reimagine um, a path forward. So I'm, I'm really excited because I think this is a critical piece to every kid having what they need at a neighborhood school and having program alignment um, and us really, really repairing a lot of harm that's been done in our, in our community. So I also don't have any questions right now, but I'm very excited um, and, and grateful for you giving us this framework to work from. Great, thank you. And we do, we definitely plan to, you know, update you guys often. So I might not come on your screen, but there will be board updates <laughs> as we're going through this work uh, pretty often to keep you guys abreast. Thank you, Sarita. I, I would like to say not only thank you, but I am so proud of um, the, the insight, the, the energy, the wisdom that is being invested into this. And I really appreciate how that showed up in the, the presentation that you made. Um, you know, we, we talked a little bit tonight when we were going over the thought exchange, this, this idea of, you know, are we, um, talking about equity and anti-racism or are we doing equity and anti-racism? And um, this moment, um, reviewing the early childhood report that we reviewed previously, these are moments that make my, my heart leap um, because as a Black woman who once feared bringing my children to District 65, um, I know the impact of the work that we are doing for, for every single child in this district. They are going to be a force of nature because of the work that we are doing to allow them an educational experience that is loving and uplifting of everyone's humanity because of the accurate history and, and curriculum that they're going to have access to um, because of the faith and the investment that they are going to receive from us. And, and one day they will, we will come to a board meeting and we will see their faces and we will hear their stories and they will be able to um, tell stories that are not rooted in harm, but in hope. And that, that is what I, I see in us having this discussion tonight. And when I hear folks who are surprised by this discussion, I, I want to remind our community that we are not, as has been alluded to, we are not haphazardly throwing things around. We are pursuing diligently, consistently, without being deterred, a vision. We are pursuing a vision and equity is the umbrella for that vision and reducing harm and investing in folks who have historically not been invested in or historically have been underestimated is what we are seeking to repair. And that is woven through everything that we are doing. Um, 
And I, I, I hope that is apparent in the discussion that we had. What we are talking about with our structural deficit, what we talked about in our finance committee is not terribly different than what we are talking about at our working board meeting because the umbrella is the same, the strategy is the same. Um, and this is what our community deserves. This is what our children deserve. I feel like, um, you know, these are challenges. We are confronting challenges that folks have said can't, can't be confronted. It cannot be done. And I think what we see in this proposal is the, uh, and even in our conversation about the structural deficit, we, what we see is that in community, the impossible can be tackled. In community, the impossible can be done. And when we invest in hopes for our big, big dreams for ourselves and our community, um, we can bring the, the right minds, the right hearts to the table and do incredible things. Um, and, you know, four years ago, when Sunny and I said that we wanted to lead with transparency and inclusivity, um, I think at the time, maybe those seemed like lofty hopes. But this in practice is, is what that looks like. We're talking about making a big and difficult decision in community with our community. And we're talking about dealing with those big feelings on the front end of the decision making. Not surprising folks with a ready-made decision and, and folks having grief and confusion and concern about that. Um, this is not being done in the shadows. This is being done in the light. It's being done in the light and we're proposing that we put it in the light and that we link arms and we bring our best to the table to figure this out on behalf of each other and our collective good, our collective children. These are, our schools are a common good. And I feel like this proposal reflects that commitment and um, I'm excited and energized by it. Um, and I'm, I'm proud and appreciative um, of, of our administration, Sarita, of you, of our, our board as well. I'm, I'm proud and appreciative of our collective lift in, in, in investing in this. Well, I, I thank you guys. Much gratitude. I mean, as a, I, I'm like super, super humble and honored. Uh, I grew up in the fifth floor. So to even be in this position is like super nostalgic for me. Um, I mean, I, Jip the system a little bit. I went to Dewey, but I came back and went to Haven. So uh, I, I really, really uh, appreciate you guys for um, trusting me with with this work. Um, and I will um, do I, do my best to to get to that vision and and the mission at hand. So thank you all. Thank you. So we look forward to the updates in terms of the the costs and the opportunity to speak with. Um, and hear from some of the, the bidders um, for investing in this and um, look forward to the ongoing updates. And I encourage our community to check out the application and get involved. Um, the more interdisciplinary team that we have, the, the better. Um, thank you so much. Was there any, did anyone have anything else that wanted to contribute to the student assignment discussion before we move on? Uh, I just wanted to add one thing. So I know that you said 30 people and given our community, I think you might find it challenging to limit it to 30 people. And I just thought about, um, because we are, you know, I'm, I'm sure that you have some sort of rubric in mind to, you know, how you select and just ensuring that um, we have a, a, a good representation of all of our wards and all of our um, attendance areas. So I just wanted to add that in, um, in, in making sure that wh whoever, you know, you probably will have a challenge cutting it down to 30 people. So just wanted to make sure that there is some intentionality behind, you know, who we have from, from uh, how many wards and, you know, making phone calls if we need to, um, so that, you know, you know, folks who don't answer surveys or emails, I just, you know, think of um, making sure that we have the right people on board for that. And um, just wanted to add that. Yep, absolutely. We, um, our, our consultant firm is actually going to help us 
do that so we can, uh, I, I just know too many people, I've been here my whole life, fourth generation, so I want to be uh, blind to some of the um, identifying markers, but the ward specifically is going to be one that we see so we can make sure, uh, to your point, that we have that representation, uh, but we're going to take all identifying things off, so we really are just looking at um, the members and their answers and based on our rubric and making sure we have that representation for sure. Sarita, I'm assuming we will also have a, a representative from Skokie, right? Because they wouldn't be in that ward classification, yeah, just yeah, to make sure that yeah. we, thank you. That's one way, it's like all the wards in Skokie, yeah. <laughs> and will those applications be available in uh, Spanish as well? And Yep, absolutely. All right, great. Thank you so much. Um, next on our agenda is our middle school math update. All right, thank you, Anya. Um, and good evening to everybody. Uh, this evening, David Wartowski, our director of STEM, is going to bring an update on math acceleration and our work to essentially reimagine math acceleration. To briefly provide the background on this update, Please recall that in the spring of 2020, we suspended a math acceleration process that was in place in District 65. This suspension was a result of the fact that we did not have the test scores that we needed to potentially place students in accelerated courses. We also agreed to support and monitor the shift. This update is focused on that work. Before we dig in with David, I also wanna remind you that this accelerated placement pro assessment process, though well-intentioned, and creating potential opportunity for some has been harmful, social, emotionally, and academically. And this harm has been felt by students who are and are not accelerated. Additionally, the process has perpetuated racial placement patterns within our math classes. I applaud the teachers and the STEM team who've worked incredibly hard and with incredible passion to create a better way to bring accelerated learning and challenge for our students within our classrooms accessible to all students. David. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Stacy and um, uh, Sarita. The presentation of the worker team is a tough act to follow, but I, I have to say I've been looking forward to uh, being able to update um, the board on, and on on the work that's been going on for quite some time, and to really celebrate a lot of hard work and collaboration that's been going on for for, for quite some time. Um, going into the results we've seen, the impact, and talking about the path ahead. So. You know uh, what I'll be talking about here is is like so what's different what what ha what's a reminder of what's different this year as opposed to prior years and then just sit in the like so how's that gone you know we had certain intentions but what was the impact and what key learning do we think we have from that and then a look at uh, the road ahead uh, what what is as we've reflected on the past year what does that mean going forward so pausing to say so what's different. Um, Quick background, uh, just to update, I think we're aware of this, uh, but right back in May, so um, not quite a year ago, we had communicated that we were suspending the alternate math placements for this fall. And we committed that we'd be monitoring the math learning very closely. And that we'd be providing recommendations for next steps for math acceleration in the early spring. And here we are coming back to that conversation. Um, so what was different this year is that we had placement within the grade. That was um, one big difference. So uh, students went on to the next level. Students in sixth grade, they took math six. Students in seventh grade took math seven. Students in eighth grade, they took algebra. Um, there was one exception to that, right? So if students who were already in alternate placing, any seventh graders um, who had taken uh, math six, seven last year would take algebra this year, right? Any eighth graders who took algebra last year would take geometry this year. So that was one thing that was different this year. A second thing that was different this year was the curriculum itself. So we had um, illustrative math being used in all grade levels. In two of those grade levels, we had Desmos being used, which was built off of illustrative math. Uh, we were really excited to have Desmos included this year. Um, it will become uh, what we have sixth through eighth grade, but it was only available this year, seventh and eighth grade. But we, um, there was 1,500, uh, about 1,500 districts that applied to use uh, this new core curriculum built off of the highly rated illustrative math. And it turned out that we were one of uh, 40 districts uh, that had at the time been accepted to, um, to use the curriculum, um, creating a great partnership with them in, 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 in using that core curriculum. But the second thing we did, it wasn't just that. We also um, 
brought in uh, tiered tasks and individual choice for our students. We had a massive amount of work from teachers past summer uh, creating a large library of, 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 of these tiered tasks um, that were aligned to learning expectations. The intention was that it allowed students then to um, have further challenge even beyond the core curriculum. So while there was differentiation within that uh, core curriculum from illustrative math, there's also the opportunity for um, individualized choice, uh, whether I want to go on to a really, really challenging uh, task, or perhaps I need to address some unfinished learning, or maybe I just want to practice where I'm at. Um, so that was a big piece that we put in place this year. And then finally, also just intensified professional development. Um, we knew that what we were doing requires an investment uh, in, in, in our educators. And so we had summer opportunities available and many opportunities throughout the year that were really amped up from before. Um, a pause just to sort, sort of uh, remember about the former system. So while we had um, known that without the, as, as, as Dr. Beers had mentioned, without the data in place last year, uh, we ended up um, halting the alternate placement. But um, even before the pandemic, there were things about the former system that certainly gave us um, some pause, right? And some concern. Um, so one was, there was racialized access to rigor. Um, as you can see highlighted in the graph below, there were huge differences into who ended up being placed into um, our, our alternate classes, the math six, seven or skipping math seven. Um, rough numbers, if you were a white student in Evanston, about one in three would end up into that space where they ended up taking geometry in eighth grade. But the numbers for black students, for Latinx students, uh, depending on the year was closer to something like one in 50. Um, we also had concern uh, about having what turned out to be five years of standards taught in three years of middle school. Um, that is a lot of learning for uh, a three-year period. And considering also that we did it in, in middle school, um, it you know, turned out that's the only time in the whole K-12 experience that we as an Evanston community were having more than a year's worth of standard, uh, standard at any time. And here it was five years of standards in just three years for those students who were taking geometry in eighth grade. Um, Another one was that fifth grade scores were impacting high school trajectory and high school access. So it, it, by that system, we would notice that, uh, for example, um, something like 88% of students who, were, um, who, 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 who scored on these tests in such a way that they were in place in other classes would be uh, end up taking two APs or more in high school or math APs. Um, but that number for students who didn't uh, hit that, that cutoff, um, that number was closer to zero. Uh, there were very few students who would end up taking two math APs um, who didn't access those classes. So you had pretty high stake testing going on um, as early as fifth grade. Um, there was also costs, right? There's the financial cost that was around busing, uh, the altered class size were in some cases, we might have to run a class with seven kids in it. Um, and then the testing procedures themselves, all of those had a financial cost. There's also a personnel cost. Um, while it's difficult to attach uh, money to that, if we think about all the work that goes into the busing, the ultra class size, the scheduling, the testing procedures, it was massive. Um, and, and if you account all of the um, the, the work done to, to have conversations at the building level and district level and within classrooms and all of that, you know, it, we, we figured out that about a quarter of a million dollars just in personnel time was, 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 was at hand. Um, again, tough to measure, but that, that's, it's, it's, it, was, it was a big cost. Also, just a social emotional impact of students. And Dr. Beardsley alluded to this early and when she uh, kicked off this presentation, but we saw those anecdotally and consistently, whether or not a student was put, was in this alternate placement. Um, there was the effects of the students who just barely made that cutoff. And I can tell you stories about tears I saw, but I can also tell you about st stories of tears I saw from students who had made the cutoff and they were, they had concerns too, whether it happened in middle school or in high school where a number of them would, would, would drop off or uh, from that track, or they would, um, they would, they, they would doubt themselves um, as being a strong student, even if they had, they were in, if these were students with the 95th percentile scores who were starting to think whether they really were good at math after all. Um, so there was a toll uh, to be taken social emotionally on all of our students um, as a result of the, of the system that we had. Um, on the right is an example, by the way, of some of the unintended consequences, you can uh, think about social emotional impacts. Um, this is a test, you know, we graded these um, centrally and, you know, we pass this out to something like 1,700 students every 
year. And the student simply said, I'm dumb, I don't know. And I guess because I don't know. So what were we telling the student about her abilities or his abilities as a math student? This someone who's likely very good at math, but this test was telling them, eh, I don't know. Um, so the pathway that we had this past year um, looks like this. Students in math in sixth grade took math six, students in seventh took math seven, students in eighth grade taking algebra. And uh, in that space, as I mentioned before, there's extension opportunities. So the acceleration is happening in a couple of ways. So first of all, our system, our pathway is innately accelerated because there's four years of standards going on in the three years of middle school that we have. So that already puts us in a space where we're a year accelerated um, beyond the, the uh, college and career expectations outlined by the Common Core. In addition to that, however, uh, we accelerate the learning, not just in that core curriculum I mentioned before, but also those extension opportunities that I mentioned, uh, those tier tasks that allow students self-choice. Um, it's a few things are important to, to, um, to note here. One is that um, the, the pathways in high school remain intact. So there's no, uh, it was very important to us that we did not uh, limit or take away the access uh, to any number of, of to, to access to, to the levels of math in, in high school. So that remains. Um, and also for students who want to make a decision for, for high school pathways, they can make that at the end of eighth grade or during eight, the, the latter end of eighth grade year, which is a time when students are more mature and also rather than having a high stakes uh, testing going on to determine pathways early on, now we've got a richer portfolio of work that can help a student to understand where they should be placed and, and help those who are coaching and advising the student to have a rich amount of information as to what pathway that they, that, that they can follow. Um, for students who would wanna go on to take MV calculus um, um, is, as a senior, uh, they would have to get credit for, for geometry and there's a, a number of ways to do that. A couple examples of that would be a summer course in geometry. Um, another example might be uh, doing independent study. Uh, it's important to the high school that you have the, the, um, the knowledge of geometry, but it's not important that, that, that you sit in the class, uh, this particular class, right? So if a student can demonstrate their learning how, how, however they got it, uh, that, that's sufficient then to be able to move on. So those are a couple examples of how that could be done. And traditionally, just to put in context, um, about 4% uh, of, of students at Evanston uh, end up taking multivariable calculus during their high school years. Um, so intentions, um, let's start with that. What did we expect? So going into this school year, we had a lot of discussions within the department um, and they really started with what we value. So you can see a number of things that came up there, collaboration and student choice and that appropriate challenge, self-awareness, a, a whole variety of things. And as we, as we sat with these things that we collectively value, we said, okay, well, how will we see this? Um, and it came down to looking, thinking about really three lenses. We thought about, well, we need to see active engagement. We need to see active engagement. Uh, academic growth and attainment. Uh, what, what do students know and understand? And then thirdly, culture, mindset. Um, what do students feel? Um, and all the while isolating race. Um, one thing we had a lot of conversation about is if we, if we no longer have a system um, that has racial predictability, um, does, we, we don't want to have a system replicate itself in a new way within the classroom. So that was something that we were looking for. So in order to look at these lenses, we utilized student survey, map data, uh, we brought in compression planning um, and, and, and teacher input were all uh, part, of, part of what we leveraged. And as we're doing that, we were considering, are, are students feeling challenged? Um, do students have a sense of, uh, that they're engaged? Do they have a sense of identity as a mathematician? Um, we looked to, to hear from our teachers. What did they think about their experience? What was a lived experience of, of these changes? Um, and, and then also high school preparedness. Um, what were we seeing in terms of students throughout all this being prepared for high school? Um, and again, reduced racialized outcomes, uh, something that we saw across many measures. Um, and, and then uh, we were looking for the equitable um, practices. So impact, those were our intentions. What did we see? Um, so we collected quite a bit of data and in this presentation, I'm highlighting a few uh, so you can have an, a, an idea of, of the types of um, things that, that are, I think are of note. Um, so starting with challenge, uh, a question that we asked is um, to ask students to, to rate 
uh, on certain, um, you know, their levels of agreeing or, or disagreeing, uh, all the way from strongly disagree up to strongly agree on several statements. One of them was, I have opportunities in my math class to engage in challenging work. Well, about 78% um, of our middle school math students said yes, that they do. They either agreed or strongly agreed with that. Um, and we saw about 5% um, disagreed with that. So this is good news, right? There's a, there's a strong uh, you know, preponderance, I'd say, like we see far more students agreeing or, dis or strongly agreeing with that than disagreeing. We also wanted to look at it in different layers. So one of them was by quartiles. And I think, you know, what we can see here is a trend that in the second, third, and fourth quartiles, not a lot of difference. Um, so I think a good news there is that, you know, students in that upper quartile uh, are as likely as students in second and third to, to agree with that statement um, in, in this past year. Uh, I think what came up worth noting is the, the first quartile was the, the, the least likely to agree with that statement. Um, which I think is just something for us to sit with and, and, and consider. Um, another thing too is, to, so now I'm looking at the right side of the screen. Um, we, we'd like that, that red sliver to be as close to zero as possible. We really don't want any students who are feeling that they're not engaged in challenging work. Um, well, so we also look within that sliver to say, but how many of these students are in fact, uh, when they are not feeling challenged, are they choosing the challenging tasks when they have that choice? Um, and uh, about a quarter of them were, but then one of the opportunities is that three quarters of those students are not, were not yet choosing, or they were, they were, we asked them, are you choosing the most challenging tasks? And they said, no, no, I'm not. So uh, that was a space I think where we could see some, hopefully um, more media improvement and reducing the, that red sliver there. And there we go, oops, apologies, my computer is, So then, um, okay, there we go. So then the next question we asked was, um, we wanted to, so this is good news in terms of the amount of challenge, but one thing we had to sit with is, well, but how does this compare to last year? What's to say that last year students were, um, they were also feeling super challenged. Um, so ideally we would have asked that exact same question a year ago, but we didn't, we didn't have that historical data. So the best we could do is what you see on this slide. We had a statement that said, I have more opportunities in my math class to engage in challenging work this year than I did last year. And so um, what we're seeing there is that, um, again, uh, showing that you know over half, so uh, I think about 53-ish percent in general, we're saying, yeah, in fact it was 53% in general or agreeing or strongly agree with that. Whereas the, the number of percent of students who disagreed with it was about 15% in general. Again, looking across race this time, did we see any variance? Um, perhaps, um, but with the end sizes we have, like I certainly would, con would not conclude that there is racial predictability here. So that's good news that uh, so far as we can tell, it seems that race is not necessarily playing a role um, in students' perception of, of challenge, at least as compared to last year. Uh, one thing important to note is that this particular set of data, what we did is we looked at those respondents who um, felt okay about remote learning, right? So there was another question that said, whether uh, do you agree or strongly disagree? You know, where, where do you fit on the statement that remote learning has had a negative impact on your math class? And so we wanted to isolate away the effects of remote learning itself. And about a third of our students said, no, they disagreed. Like, no, remote learning has not had a negative impact on my math class. So this is the results that we saw there. Um, are students feeling uh, prepared for high school? So that's another question we asked. I feel like I'll be prepared for high school. Um, and here we're seeing that um, there's again, some, some differences across the quartiles. So I think not so surprisingly, we see that from the second, third to the fourth quartile, the higher the quartile, the more um, that students are in fact feeling that they're prepared for high school. Uh, but I think also worth noting is what we're seeing in the lowest quartile that um, some, the students in the first quartile are, are about as, as, as are, are perceiving at about the same levels as the third quartile that, that they are prepared for high school. So that's something for us, I think, to, uh, to consider and learn more about. But I think good news that overall, um, 
you know, we, it's, students are generally feeling that, in fact, yes, I'm prepared for high school. Um, so then to look at the preparedness for high school, we turn to our map data to see that, um, what we're finding there. And one look we took was um, at attainment. So we asked what percent of students are at or above the 50th percentile uh, looking at, uh, we used the winter scores. And the story here is that despite a pandemic, by and large, we're seeing numbers that are pretty much what we've seen in prior years. Um, there's a, a slight drop. If you look, if you isolate, uh, if you look for any differences from prior years, it's only within white students that we see a bit of a drop um, from prior years, which could be a cohort effect, like we don't know, um, but by and large, pretty much the same as, as, as last year. Um, we then looked at growth, however, and I think here's where we have, um, when I talk about celebrating, I think this is something really to sit with. Um, to see a slide here where there's really no predictability by race, I think is just amazing and a huge testament to um, the work that has happened uh, for quite some time. Um, this is not data that I think we're used to seeing. I certainly see for myself, I'm not used to seeing. Uh, we have yet to see this in our other grade levels. Um, and we didn't see it in the past two years in middle school math, but we did see it this year. So, um, and meanwhile, if you look in, 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 in like compared to prior years, um, I think we're still staying strong. So we've got strong growth and um, a lack of racial predictability when it comes to growth, academic growth. We asked students directly about the curriculum. So um, as you're probably saying before, there's really two aspects of curriculum that we brought in that were new this year. So one was Desmos in seventh and eighth grade and the other one was these individualized tasks. So we asked students, what are one or two words that you would use to describe Desmos? And you can see what jumped out when we had that very open-ended question. Um, fun, good, helpful, challenging. Um, I think, you know, they're high school students, or excuse me, they're middle school students. So the word boring certainly made the list too, but I was really thrilled to see that that, that word is smaller uh, on the Wordle than fun, good, and helpful, and even lower, smaller than challenging because those words were coming up more often. Um, when it came to um, asking them about the choice tasks, which were that opportunity to, for student to pursue as much challenge as they would like, um, we were happy to see that about 90, uh, about 93% about of our students were in fact making those choices that had become a part of our curriculum. So only about 7% were like, wait, I don't, I don't really know what that is. Um, about half of our students end up taking that regular level. They say, well, I'm just gonna practice it further. But you do have about 14% that are taking on that challenge, that super challenge task. So we got about a quarter of our, of our students who say, oh, wait a minute, I got to step back. And maybe I need that, the, 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 the extra practice is a little more scaffolded or helps with some of my unfinished learning. And I think in all cases, uh, able to accelerate the learning for, for all of um, our, our students. Um, apologize, I'm having, there we go. Um, so they also mentioned, you know, we wanted to turn to our teachers. And so, so what do you, what's your perception? What do you think of this? And um, we, we said that the STEM department is ready to propose a system that intends to advance equity and strong math instruction by eliminating math six, seven and limiting the system of testing for purpose of alternate math placement. And instead focus on providing challenge differentiation and the option uh, for acceleration for all students through a single pathway, focusing on um, acceleration through instruction. We asked, do you support this proposal? And what we saw, what we found is that um, the vast majority of our department said yes. Um, about two thirds just said yes. Uh, another quarter said yes with some reservations. Um, and then we had some undecided and just a little bit of no. Um, so in terms of reservations, the themes there were along the lines you see in the bottom of the slide. So, well, you know, what are the considerations for students who are several grade levels below in math skills or have severe cognitive delays? So it was not a concern about um, a student who should be skipping necessarily, but more a concern about the acceleration of, of the, some students, perhaps like in the, in the first quartile I was mentioning before. Um, we also said, well, we need to allow for some specific instances for a very small number of students. Um, and then uh, there was also some notions of, well, but um, what supports are we doing for math differentiation in K-5? Like we want the, the middle school teachers were acknowledging that we need to think about that space as well. 
Um, and then um, there's also just a, a worry expressed for some of the students, uh, some of the teachers who said yes with the reservations. They said, well, you know, just worry about making a choice during a pandemic. So they're sort of sitting with that. Um, from our teacher leaders, uh, they wrote a, a statement very close to this um, back in the summer, and then we revised it more recently. So I'm just gonna read this. And as I read it, I want you to, to picture not my voice, but the collective voice of, of teachers who have been a, 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 an integral part of this work. They said in the last few years, about one in three white students would place in the classes that led to eighth grade geometry. While the number of black and Latinx students following his path has been closer to one in 50, depending on the year. The district's move to detract this school year has interrupted our racist practices as a system. We support this change and are eager to carry out empowering and equitable practices in our classroom. Part of this work is that of differentiation while honoring teacher individuality, creativity and flexibility we see differentiation as holding racial equity at its core, providing an authentic, culture responsive and rigorous environment that is conducive to the success of all learners. I think it's really important that um, the board understands the commitment of our educators. Um, this is just showing you in a very mathy way, I'll give you a Venn diagram here. About 80% of our department played a role last summer in getting ready for what they knew would be just a massive year. We had 20 teachers that were in learning workshops around self-direct, uh, were in workshops around self-directed learning. Um, it, it, some described it as that college course that it just killed you, but you loved it. They, they, they learned tons and invested a lot of time and energy into that. About 23 were involved in um, summer projects across the board. A lot of it were, rest, were, were around the building of those tasks that I mentioned uh, that created the, the tier tasks with student choice and 10 teachers did both. Um, so really a massive, massive commitment from our department. Um, we also, uh, we, we use the uh, racial equity impact assessment um, early in this work and often we came back to it again more recently saying, okay, and as we sit now in this process, where are we? Um, and uh, we did this with the, with, the, with the math chairs and the proposal received a passing score from that group. Um, it also, um, I think a, a powerful part of using the, the racial equity impact assessment is not just whether we get a passing score or not, but it also helps to unearth the, so what now? Um, we didn't get a perfect score. So like, okay, so what would make it better? And um, some of the implications we, we discussed were, so, you know, we think that we recognize there has been student involvement. How can we have even more? We've had parent involvement. How can we have even more? Um, and also that we want to keep a really close eye on what happens as we transition to brick and mortar um, versus the experience we've had this year. Um, some of that involvement of students and parents looked like this. We, I mentioned the compression planning. Uh, we had a student group uh, where we had uh, six students involved. Uh, we simply posed the question, what do you need to help you learn in math class? And it was awesome to listen to them. Uh, they basically described culture <laughs> responsive pedagogy without ever having perhaps opened a book or heard that terminology before. But they, you know, they talked about lively classrooms where students were exchanging ideas. And I'm just so proud uh, that that is in fact, you know, what we're doing more and more and more of in our classrooms. Um, we've worked on that for years and Desmos is allowing us to take it to yet another level um, along with just the, the massive work of our teachers. Um, and then we also held a, um, a, a group uh, of, of uh, 12 adults that were largely made up of um, parents and um, we had some admin from uh, ETHS uh, and a few from district office and we sat with two questions. So one is what did we need? To, what do we need uh, in an inclusive rigorous classroom to make sure math acceleration via instruction is successful for all learners? Um, and you know, the, whether they're working above grade level, at grade level or working towards grade level. We also asked, how does D65 make it hard for students of color um, to do well in middle school math? And so from all of this work, we ended up having 19 top ideas generated. Um, and that led to identifying 14 definitive actions around improvement of our system, um, which just helped us, I think, to continue to build recognizing that the work of social justice is, is, isn't a destination, it is a process and continuing to grow and build and grow and build. Some key takeaways as we reflect um, on this data that I presented to you, as well as some other data that we did through our analysis. So start with um, just three points of, I think, just good news. Um, the fact that there's no racial predictability in terms of students making expected gains when we look at middle school math. 
um, that other metrics as well also show little to no racial predictability. So for example, students sense of challenge or their sense of, of identity as a mathematician. And also the students were feeling, have been feeling challenged. They feel prepared for high school and generally feel that this year is a better experience than last year for math um, when we isolate for the um, effects of remote learning. Um, some things to just pause, I think for us to think about. So when students, um, we saw that in the data that when students are aware of what the learning expectations are and where they are in their own learning, they also have a strong math identity. They're more excited and more proud. I think that relationship between those two are, are, um, are, are, are worth noting. Also that math, student math identity and student choice um, seem to have a relationship with feeling prepared for high school. Um, so even more reason to think about the, the, the importance of learning expectations and students sort of seeing where they are um, in their own learning. We also sat, as you mentioned, as you heard me mentioned before, is there a relationship between race and student choice in those level tasks? Well, the answer is potentially, we really don't know. We would have to do more uh, work to analyze that. Uh, it, it, we did not get a solid answer on that one way or another as we did the analysis just so far. Um, Opportunity. Well, a fourth of our students do not have an awareness of where they are in their learning, um, of what they are learning or where they are in their learning. Um, so the third, fourth class full is that that many people, like 75% of them do. So that's great. But we want to get that as close to 100% as possible on knowing the importance of that and the relevance to their building their math identity. Um, so um, some students feel unchallenged. Um, we talked about before, there's the slivers relatively small, but it's there and we wanna get, get that closer to zero. So some, in some cases not yet choosing challenging tasks, but yet in some cases they are. So we got 2% of all students that are not feeling challenged despite choosing those challenging tasks. So that's something for us to wrestle with. And then finally, the perception of having opportunities for challenge decreases among students with the relatively high math scores or the relatively low. Um, and we saw more, more of it on those low math schools, the lowest percentile. So that's something for us to dig into more. Finally, next steps, um, three big ones. So the, I'll start with the first one, that is the biggest, is that we're acceleration of learning. Uh, so math acceleration is really in, uh, important for us and that here we are envisioning it uh, and enacting it through curriculum and instruction. So what does that mean? It means that our next steps are we can use Desmos as a core curriculum in all of our grades. Now it's the, as it becomes available in sixth grade in the fall, we wish to have Desmos as our core curriculum in sixth, seventh and eighth grade, making it our full middle school math curriculum. We also wish to continue development of the learning expectations uh, to which we have assessments, activities and choice tasks are aligned. So that's work that is well underway from last summer, as I mentioned, but we know we can grow that even more. Um, this means that we would discontinue the, 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 the district-wide math placement testing process and instead be using, utilizing a formal process of assessment that's in line with the Illinois Acceleration Act, um, which means that math six, seven then would, would not be a necessity. Uh, instead, we would have a, a robust and already accelerated curriculum for all of our students. Um, also looking ahead, um, we know we need to continue to monitor. We need to, as, as, as we grow and build, we need to pay a close eye as I said before, you know, starting with our values and holding those lenses um, and, and, and seeing like, do our, does the impact match our intentions? Um, professional development um, has to grow as well as we, as we recognize where we're strong, where we need work and making adjustments along the way. And finally, just staying in communication. You know, we had, uh, we had two information sessions last year. Uh, we're scheduling another one coming up um, soon in March and uh, continue to have engagement with stakeholders, especially students and parents as we seek to learn more about um, what we continue to do better. I'm good for questions. It's late everyone, let's, let's come on. <laughs> That's what you really think, Dr. Horton. Um, Thank you for this presentation. And um, as one of the board members who was part of the concussion planning, I really appreciated that opportunity to uh, be involved in that process. And I, I think there was a lot of consensus about what we're hoping for in a new acceleration model and, and that is um, equitable. Um, so if, 
thank you. I think this is um, tremendous work. Um, I, I thought I saw in an earlier um, set of uh, slides perhaps about the, the distinction between depth and speed, right, of learning um, that, you know, we shouldn't mistake like compressing all of this math, the speed at which students are, are going through the curriculum as, you know, the kind of deep math education that we want. So if you could talk a little bit more about that and what the Desmos pilot showed us about depth and speed. Yeah, no, I, I, I thank you, um, Sula, for, for bringing that up. I think um, oftentimes I think that when we, um, and this is when I say we, this is I think a broad thing that goes way beyond Evanston nationally. There's a sense like, oh, I want more challenge. And so it's like, oh, I'll just, I do the next thing. So I'm done with this topic, go to the next one. Yet, um, you know, the, the leaders in, in, in mathematics education would argue that the, the depth is within the grade level standards themselves. There's so much richness. And um, that's, that, is, that is critical in what we're doing is to, is to not just speed along. Um, that, is, that is not the riches and beauty of mathematics by any stretch. There's so much to uncover within every grade. And, you know, Desmos, um, you know, you asked about that. A way that Desmos, for example, does that is that uh, when a problem is presented students are immediately brought in and say, so what do you, what do you think? I saw um, you know, a lesson today where I would watch a video as a student, right? The, the, the tortoise and the hare, and I'm watching the video and I have to describe what's happening, but I'm also seeing it on a graph and I'm trying to relate the graph to the picture and my voice matters. Uh, I heard that mentioned earlier, like how are we lifting up? Um, I think Anya was talking about student voice and how lifting that up and that's a, that's a big part of equity work. Every single student's voice there um, comes into play, and I have to build on other people's voices. And so a teacher might say, "So you know, so and so offered this idea. If you want to stop and revise your own thinking based on what she shared, you stop and do that." And you can literally on the screen begin to see students' words change, and you can see maybe what they drew change. And so there's an interaction between the students that really empowers them um, to make to, for their own own sense making. Right? This is not about students regurgitating what the teacher has to say. It's about them seeing themselves in the work and, and doing it collectively. Um, and so I think that those are really powerful practices that allow students to come alive in ways um, that, that, uh, that are really enriching and, and humanizing and challenging <laughs> academically. And it sounds like um, it's also less about getting the right answer first, right? And more about thinking, rethinking, and revising, which is right. a lot of the ways that we approach um, language arts, right? You think, you revise, reevaluate, and reflect, um, but that we haven't really seen in math instruction as much and that we really do need in math instruction. So um, I'll be curious to see the data as we go, as we um, roll it out full. Um, and I hope we see that the, this early promising data holds. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yes, I just wanted to, again, thank you, David, and uh, the whole team for, 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 again, giving us this presentation. And again, just, um, you know, what I'm seeing, the common thread here is just the work around equity, right? So, so going back to what my colleagues were saying, how, again, we've been getting comments, like, why are you thinking about this? You know, math and then thinking about you know uh, student assignments again this is the, the the common thread here is equity right and what we're seeing here is just this um you know this 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 movement right uh, it's moving to the needle for communities that have been disinvested in for so long right so uh, and and I, I, just to make it clear i i want i would love for my children to have access to multivariate calculus if it's if it's so, they're choosing right all of us would want that uh, uh you know, a lot of us don't know that that's an option. Uh, so that's one piece, right? So for the folks who have the privilege of that knowledge and have kept it for themselves for so long, uh, wow, you know, this is, this is eye-opening. You know, I, when I first got, uh, signed up my kids to the district, you know, we didn't realize that uh, algebra was, was offered in the middle school, right? I, I often talk to my wife about this. And, you know, again, uh, when I was growing up, again, we, you, you ha we didn't take algebra until you were a uh, freshman in high school. So just to just to let you know that, 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 that and, and this as, as history, like always going back to history, is that again, you know, uh, you know, again, children now 
are learning so much more, are expected to learn so much more than they were in the past. And I thought I'd seen some studies a couple of years back around what, you know, content the ch children are being taught uh, and, and the comparison of what, what, what's being taught nowadays, what children have to learn versus what was learned back, you know, in, in our times when we were younger. And again, we're expecting children to learn so much more because we realize that they have the capacity to, right? So, and then going back to that comment around, you know, the depth of it, right? And, 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 and also being able to work through a problem and not, being the, make, not making an erase of who gets it first, but really, you know, how do we facilitate collaboration between children to solve, you know, math problems or, or any type of the, any piece of the curriculum? Because at the end of the day, right, I think the value of education is that, you know, we, we, we find ways to create curriculum that engages children individually and challenges them individually, but when they can't do it by themselves, guess what? We need to work together as a team to solve this problem. So, you know, my hope is that Desmos is like that. And I, I, from what I'm hearing is that's how it is. Um, another thing I really want to, you know, build on too is that, uh, you know, and, and this should be across all curriculum is that thinking, you know, make, letting children know and how, how do we get children to be aware, right? And, and then parents also to be aware where the children are at academically and what's the task at hand, right? And how, how wonderful, right? And I, I just read a study in the paper the other day about uh, folks doing exercise, right? And uh, they have folks who, um, and this is adults, and, and they had a, 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 a one group, a control group that was told, you know, oh, you, you can do this. And it was positive motivation. You're great. You're going to do this. And there was another group that was told, uh, uh, you could do this, but this is going to be hard. But here's how you got to do it. And, and guess, which, guess, guess which group uh, got farther is the folks that were told that this is, goal. It's going to be hard. It's not going to be easy, but here's what you can do. So again, all we're asking here in the equity work is that we want the very same things that our most privileged parents, you know, want for their kids, right? We want the challenge. We want the curriculum. We want access to, uh, you know, uh, uh, high quality challenges for all our children, right? We want the supports uh, and, and trust us, we will get there if we, if you give us the resources and supports, right? And I think you know that 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 is not 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 a bad thing to ask for, right? Uh, and it's 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 sad that a lot of folks have kept it to themselves. And it's interesting to hear folks now say, "Well, you know, this is uh, you know now we're going to miss out on, on on some black children and some Latinx children who could take advantage of you know the, these current options. Where were they before? You know, so so you know now 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 it's, now, now it's brought up that, that that we you know that that we need to do that for them. And I just think. Again, I think we can have high, high expectations for all children and we can normalize success for all children if we commit ourselves as a community to do that. And I think this is the work that we're doing here. So thank you for all the work that you are doing and, and your team and business. Thank you. Thank you, Sergio. Yeah, Sunny. Hey, um, I recognize the late hour, so I will try to keep this brief, but um, just a couple of things I wanted to, Thank you for the presentation. And I really wanted to highlight a couple of things. One, that your statement that, you know, our existing math pathway for all students is already an accelerated pathway. I think that's really important. And I don't know that our parents and our community members fully understand that algebra in eighth grade is already an accelerated pathway. So we're already giving that to all students. So what we're talking about is this kind of double accelerated pathway that we have some evidence that it isn't really serving students well as they get to high school. And so one of my comments would be, if there's any way to get some additional um, data from the high school about that, because I know we've gotten some, some data and some anecdotal stories about kids dropping out of um, higher math in, in high school that have been accelerated at, in middle school. Uh, I think that's all important evidence for people to understand like why this kind of double acceleration is not actually serving students well. Um, and I think the other thing that is worth highlighting is again, the, the incredible educator involvement in this whole process. Uh, it reminds me of several years ago when we did move to algebra for all, and we had uh, a team of middle school educators, math teachers at a policy committee meeting at 10 p.m., a, you know, kind of a, like, a meeting like this tonight on the last day of school because they were that committed to this change. And I think the educator involvement here and what, what you've shown us is, 
you know, we are a, a community that we value our teachers and, and we want to hear from our teachers. And, and this is our teachers telling us this is the right thing to do. And so for us as a board to ignore that would be irresponsible. Um, so I think we, that we have to, to acknowledge and thank our, our middle school math teachers in the math department um, for, for really taking the lead on, on this equity initiative. And then finally, because I feel like I always need to bring this up whenever we talk about middle school math acceleration, which in my years on the board has been, I think every single year. Um, it's great to talk about middle school math, but we, every time we do this, we are really missing out on an opportunity to be talking about earlier math skills. And that's really what the issue needs to be. We need to, and I, I recognize, I wanna honor the educators who also um, you know, made that point that we're missing the boat if all we're focusing on is, is middle school math. We've got to talk about how we strengthen instruction. And I know from the, the, the um, report that we got uh, on our pre-K programs that, there's, that we're definitely making some movement in our pre-K programs and that's great. And I think that I'm hoping now we can take some of the energy and resources that we've been spending on the middle school acceleration piece and put it where it really can make a difference in the pre-K through, through three space. So thank you. Uh, thank yeah. you. Sir. Sorry, I, let me share it soon. Just one, one. First of all, thank you for highlighting the teachers so much. Um, that's they. They are the reason. Um, they're a brilliant group. Um, I do want to share one bit of data that I probably didn't share before. So um, what we do know from the high school, and we can search to get more data. I've heard that question. I, I, I will. I will do what we can to get more data. But I'll share this: that um, of all the students that would. Uh, historically were taking geometry in eighth grade, what we found is that only a quarter of them, about 25% of them would take MV by the end. So we do know that 75% of the, the students who had accelerated under our watch ended up not staying on that track historically. Ms. Um, David, I want to apologize because I don't think you're getting the full enthusiasm that we all feel because we're solidly into hour six of this meeting. <laughs> um, but I, 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 this is fantastic information. Um, I just wanted to say, like, as a parent who I have a sixth grader and two fifth graders, I don't think I could be more solidly in the transition time of this program and yet uh, unequivocally want to show my support. My, my sixth grader has felt all the opportunity and challenge that she needed. And I anticipate that my kids that will be in sixth grade next year will as well. I, I think we just can't highlight enough that when every child gets a chance to shine and thrive, every child wins. So um, I, I know we will all have more to say when it's not our six, but I wanted to make sure you knew that this is very exciting stuff. This is the work we should be doing. And I'm grateful for everybody on your team that's been making this happen. Thank you. I think that for what's worth, I think that's a lot of excitement. You just showed for 11 o'clock at night. So I'd like to piggyback off of that. I, I want to sit with a couple of things. Um, I want to sit with the concept that when outcomes are predictable by race, that that is essentially evidence of racism. And when we see outcomes that are not predictable by race, that is evidence of anti-racist impact. Um, and it's not enough for us to simply say that we're not racist. We need to be anti-racist in our approach to education. And so I um, want to honor and celebrate the, the fact that the um, that graph about making expected gains represent an anti-racist uh, impact of, of curriculum and instruction. And um, I also want to, yeah, reiterate again, Sunny's point that our middle school math program is already advanced. And so this idea of being hyper-focused on competition and hyper-focused on, um, you know, speed and acquisition over depth and, and quality is, um, is, is problematic in many ways. And I think, you know, if we want to make sure that we are addressing social and emotional needs and addressing care and um, commitment to the collective, that um, this proposal really 
presents us the opportunity to course correct and and still allow folks to be challenged and experience rigor. And I and I agree that I would like to see us be able to shift our energy to talking about how we ensure that these um, gaps and opportunity are closed earlier on in folks' educational uh, career with us. And I, I look forward to continuing to receive updates on the impact of um, this decision, Algebra for All, and hearing about how we are thinking about how to support folks earlier on. Um, I, Joey, did I see your hand? It's 11.06. Crazy. Um, I think one of the, thank you, David, for the presentation. Um, I think one of the nuances of what you presented um, is the, you mentioned Desmos, but it's also in the, in the investment in the educators as being more versatile and better practitioners that make them more able to take on any, uh, a, a much more um, wide range of student population and still be effective. Um, and meeting their needs. So I think uh, that's exciting um, because our teachers are awesome. They're worth the investment, but um, I'd rather invest in them than textbooks that still have the same concepts and skills being presented. Um, a, B, um, I did wanna ask, um, you mentioned the shift from getting rid of the, the testing as done to, um, to uh, I had the slide up, um, using a, a formal process of assessment in line with Public Act 100-0421. Um, is, is that going to be the mechanism for identifying exceptionalities to the system that's built to meet 95% of the population's need? That is correct, Joey. So that is the Illinois Acceleration Act. And essentially that's a much more limited process that is narrow, more narrowly focused on individual evaluations. And so we have a defined process that we've been enacting and we'll continue to enact that in the exceptionality space. Okay. And, it, and it's fair to assume that in some cases, um, meeting the needs of students that meet that exceptionality criteria might still be within uh, the continuum that, that's being described here. And in some cases, it might need to be altered based on case by case basis. That's absolutely correct. And so we've got, you know, part of the process is kind of a five finger test before we hit an the assessment portion where we determine essentially kind of as their cohort of students of which they're learning with. And so we have kind of our own process that's defined. And yes, we may receive requests that one, um, we do the school based review and say, you know, yes, we'll move you on to acceleration or no, we will not for these reasons. And once we get to acceleration, there may be students in that assessment that do qualify for something and there will be students that do not. And that's been pretty consistent the way we've been enacting the process. Great, thank you. And thank you for making tweaks to a system that still uh, provides a continuum um, at the high school with open-ended opportunities. Thank you, Joe. Um, so I just wanted to add that I also am so proud of our educators and uh, express my gratitude to you all for bringing this thoughtful presentation and um, your thoughtful leadership in this curriculum instruction, but also to our educators for all the, the work that they have put in and the, um, to express our confidence in, in them and the impact that they're having. Um, Stacy, you, I, I was a little um, concerned when you said that uh, the accel acceleration would be accessible for folks who inquire. It seems like that in itself lends itself to um, inundation and, and opportunity hoarding. Um, is there a, or is there any thought being put into how to um, resist that, that inclination or that, that type of engagement? So um, yes, Anya, while also take being honoring the requirements of the state law 
um, which has particular requirements about notification and about um, who can potentially request acceleration. The process that we've built, we engaged with a variety of educators from different disciplines. So we also have the state requ law requires that, in fact, there is an intake process that multiple stakeholders can access. But then we are then able to review the requests and determine whether we move forward with assessment or not based upon our internal criteria. And so the process that has been developed by the team of educators can help us support and weed out requests that are um, have grounds and requests that don't based on the criteria. And so we've got to balance both the requirements of the law with a lens of equity and opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Anya. I just had a, a quick comment, um, not really a question. Thank you, David, for the presentation. Uh, one thing that I'm really excited about is what this is going to do for our girls. And so we did see those gains um, in, in the, the work that we did prior to doing this work. And, um, you know, women are sorely underrepresented in our STEM fields. And I think I'm excited at the thought of knowing that this could potentially impact and inter interrupt that cycle. So just wanted to add that. I know that we didn't have uh, data specific to gender, but I think that that would be something that um, would be worthwhile noting um, with, with this work. Thank you. All right, well, thank you for the robust discussion and content this evening. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, with no further business before the board, I will adjourn this meeting at 1112. Rest well.